good morning. Good morning to all of you, doctors, medical students, and all others who have joined the Diabetes Update organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists and Sri Lanka Diabetes Federation. If I could let you know that why we became interested in organizing this program, you know that diabetes is a real big medical issue, economical issue, and a particularly a health and a social issue. The, the prevalence of diabetes this is very rapidly rising, particularly in this region, in countries like Southeast Asia, and a very big proportion of diabetics of the world are living here, and it needs attention. And particularly for newer generation, they need to be emphasized, the need to look into the, uh, the, uh, the consequences of diabetes and to take all precautions to say that they prevent it. So it is to mark the World Diabetes Day that we all three together, the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the College of Endocrinologists and Diabetes Federation decided that we conduct this program, particularly focusing medical students to update their knowledge on diabetes because we are aware that you do your clinicals, you would see diabetes. It may be in medical wards. It may be for people who are coming to get surgeries in surgical wards, or it may be the obstetric wards, the mother's pregnant diabetes in pregnancy. And sometimes even children, the type one diabetes you would see in children. So wherever that you work, you do clinical practice, even in today's con context, you saw that how diabetes became so important in management of COVID. So uh, it is in, an important subject. So have, we have lined up very, I mean, sort of uh, timely, uh, the uh, uh, topics for uh, diabetes focusing mainly the very basic knowledge for medical students. So to commence the proceedings of the update, diabetes update, let me invite the first speaker, our first speaker is Dr. Harsha Disanayake, lecturer in medicine, Department of Clinical Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. He would be talking to you on overview to diabetes, pathophysiology, types and complications. Harsha, over to you. Thank you very much, madam, and good morning to all of you. And uh, once again, welcome to this session in diabetes update organized by the SLMA in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists as a part of our events to celebrate the World Diabetes Day, which fell on 14th November. So my task for today is to give you an overview into diabetes. And what I plan to do in the coming 20, 25 minutes is to uh, talk you through the story of a and a person who lived with diabetes and examine at each time point what exactly was going on. Uh, that will be the large part of my talk. And then at the very end, I'll touch about other possible causes of diabetes or the types of diabetes. So the story begins at 20 years of age when he was a fit and well young man who was living a reasonably healthy life, except for the fact that uh, both his parents were living with diabetes, his medical history was unremarkable. Examination also didn't reveal much abnormalities, but we noted him to be having a high BMI of 28, which means he was obese. And he had some blood tests done, this is for a purpose of medical screening, and the glucose levels were normal. Fasting glucose, postprandial plasma glucose, B1C, all were normal. Let us stop for a moment here and 
try to understand how these glucose values are maintained in the normal range. We know that the main sources by which the blood receives glucose is through food that we eat through the digestive system, they are absorbed as glucose. And liver is the other main source of glucose, which produces those by breaking down the stored glycogen, the glycogenolysis, or by producing glucose using other substrates, the process called gluconeogenesis. And where does this blood glucose go? Virtually any tissue or cell in the body can use glucose for its energy requirements. But from a storage point of view, the main sources are, or main sites where glucose is transferred to be stored are into the adipose tissues, where it is stored as fat or triglycerides, and into the skeletal muscles and liver, where glucose is stored as glycogen. All of this process is under control of insulin, which is produced by beta cells in the islets of Langerhan in the pancreas. What happens when somebody takes a carbohydrate low, that is the fed state? The absorbed glucose will enter the blood, and this will be sensed by the beta cells in the pancreas, which will respond by increasing the insulin production. Insulin will drive this glucose into adipose tissue, skeletal muscles, and the liver. In the, in the same time, insulin will also inhibit the glucose output from the liver. That is by inhibiting glycogenolysis and by inhibiting gluconeogenesis. Therefore, the rise in blood glucose resulted from the ingested carbohydrate load will be mitigated and the blood glucose will be regulated or maintained in the normal range. And what happens when it goes to the fasting state? The insulin production will decrease and that will decrease the glucose transfer into the storage tissues. The reduction in insulin will also remove the inhibition on the liver, which enables it to produce the glucose and increase the glucose levels, which is otherwise going to fall in the absence of any food detail. So the life continues and five years down the line, he still remains fit and well. Unfortunately, he has taken up smoking, maybe with peer pressure or work stress or whatever that is. This is not something that we can encourage or, or promote. And we also find that he has put on some pounds and he is more and more uh, obese with a rising waist circumference. And now we start to see acanthosis make cancer, which tells me that there is insulin resistance. Blood pressure is not perfectly normal, but not uh, really meeting the criteria for hypertension. And the blood glucose levels, well, they do not meet the criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes. Fasting is not above 126. Postprandial is not about 200. A1C is not about 6.4. So it is not meeting the criteria for diabetes, but it is certainly above the normal, normal value and certainly above his previous baseline. So what is going on? Over the years, he has put on weight, which means the adipose tissue mass has expanded. This adipose tissue will produce or release more and more free fatty acids into the circulation, which will go and get stored in skeletal muscles and the liver, causing fatty liver. The end result is that all these tissues become more and more resistant to insulin, but the body can still compensate. That is, by expanding the beta cell mass and producing more and more insulin. And by doing so, even in the fed state, the glucose level will be maintained without rising to the diabetes range. <clears throat> and in the fasting state, still they will have higher insulin production because the insulin resistance is persistent, whether you eat or not at that point in time. So they have hyperinsulinemia even in the fasting state and an exaggerated response when it comes to the fed state. If we look at it in a timeline over years, the adiposity has increased. Paralleling that, the insulin resistance has increased. And to overcome that, the body has responded by increasing the insulin and C-peptide production. C-peptide, by the way, is a byproduct which is produced when the body synthesizes insulin. So it reflects the endogenous insulin production. And by this compensation, the blood glucose is maintained still within the normal or non-diabetic range. 
Fast forward another five years, at 30 years, he feels as if he's doing all right. Unfortunately, he was unable to quit smoking. He remains obese, the blood pressure has climbed up, and now all the blood sugars are consistently above the thresholds for diabetes. What has happened? He has now developed diabetes. How did that happen? The beta cells was working, beta cells were working hard. It was producing more and more insulin, but it has, the, the resistance has exceeded its capacity and the beta cells have given up. So there is less insulin production in the fit state. There is less transfer of glucose into the storage tissues, and there is less inhibition on the hepatic glucose output, which means that there are, there are more and more glucose molecules in the blood circulation, and that is hyperglycemia. Even in the fasting state, the previously increased insulin production has now gone down. Therefore, the inhibition on liver glucose output is much reduced, which means there is hyperglycemia even in the fasting state. What has happened? Adipocytic persisted or worsened, perhaps insulin resistance worsened. Beta cells tried hard, reached the maximum level, and one fine day, their function gave up. Relative to the demand, the function became inadequate. And from that point onwards, the blood glucose is starting to rise. The diabetes sets in. Well, he was convinced on some pharmacotherapeutic agents and he gets follow up rather erratically, unfortunately. And 10 years down the line, at 40 years of age, he presents again. This time, however, not feeling all right, but complaining of burning feet, which is disturbing his sleep. He has struggled with the issue of smoking, tried to cut down, but still couldn't quit altogether. Remains obese, the blood pressure is clearly off target, and so are the blood sugars. In addition, now we find that he's losing protein in the urine. The urine albumin creatinine ratio is in the moderately increased protein urea range. And we also see that the LDL cholesterol is above the desirable level, which would be about 100 for an individual with diabetes and without previous cardiovascular events. What has gone wrong? Persistent hyperglycemia damages the endothelium. Endothelium is there in all the vessels, maybe arteries, capillaries, arterioles, or even the veins. And blood vessels are everywhere in our body. That is why diabetes can affect virtually any tissue or organ in the body. How does it damage the endothelium? Persistent hyperglycemia will glycosylate the proteins in the blood circulation. These are called advanced glycosylated end products. These are toxic for the endothelium. In addition, the persistent hyperglycemia will also alter the metabolism in those endothelial cells, resulting in production of polyols, superoxides, and hexosamines, all of which can induce apoptosis of endothelial cells. This endothelial injury, when it affects larger vessels, will permit the entry of monocytes, which turn to macrophages when they escape the blood circulation, as well as the lipids and cholesterols into the subendothelial space. This will produce atherosclerotic plaques. And over years, slowly but surely, these atherosclerotic plaques will expand, narrowing the lumen of the blood vessel. One fine day, those, those plaques could rupture, and that site of rupture is a focus for thrombus formation. The thrombus at times could be large enough to totally occlude the vessel, causing acute ischemia. It can present with acute ischemia in the heart, causing acute myocardial infarction, or it could be in the brain, causing acute stroke, acute ischemic stroke, or it could be in the distal extremities causing acute limb ischemia. That is the macrovascular spectrum of diabetes complications. When this endothelial injury affects the smaller vessels or the capillaries, still it can uh, permit the in, uh, circulatory substance, uh, substances to escape into the intestine, which are toxic to the intestine 
and that can trigger off inflammation and damage to the surrounding structures or the tissues. And that is microvascular spectrum of diabetes complications. We have recognized three predominant organs where microvascular complications could affect. That is the eye causing retinopathy, kidney causing diabetes nephropathy, and nerves causing diabetes neuropathy. At this point, let me highlight the fact that in individuals with diabetes, it is the hyperglycemia that drives the endothelial injury and therefore the macrovascular and microvascular complications. But let us not forget high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, and smoking. All of these will add to the burden. They can individually cause endothelial injury and will act synergistically with hyperglycemia to worsen the damage and cause more and more problems. As I said before, when the microvascular injury or insult damages the retinal vasculature, causes diabetes and retinopathy, there are various manifestations and the disease can progress from non-proliferative stage to proliferative stage. And if you examine the fundus, examine the retina using the optic fundoscope, you would see various abnormalities and you know why those would happen. Dot hemorrhage represent microaneurysms, which are tiny dilatations of damaged vessels. Blood hemorrhages are actually tiny hemorrhages. Cotton wool spots are the foci of ischemia, and hard exudates represent the extravasate, extravasated fluids and liver proteins and other substances. When the disease affects the kidney, it damages the glomerular capillary basement membrane, it is thickened. The podocytes, podocytes are injured. Therefore, the selective filtration capacity is lost, and this will permit the proteins to be lost through the glomerular filtration and therefore in the urine. The ongoing insult will also cause the mesangial space to expand with inflammatory substances and exudates. And in response, over years and decades, there will be foci of sclerosis, which we call nodular glomerular sclerosis. And when the disease is advanced, they appear in multiple numbers, which we call Kimmelstein Wilson nodules. Similarly, when the tiny blood vessels supplying the nerves are damaged, that can cause neuropathy through nerve loss, nerve uh, neuronal death. It can affect sensory nerves, can affect motor nerves, and it can affect autonomic nerves as well. Once the sensory nerves are damaged, Commonly, they lose sensation and they lose the protective sensation that would save their limbs from inadvertent trauma. Occasionally, a patient would have gain of function or excess uh, activity of nerves causing abnormal sensations or pain. Motor dysfunction will result in muscle weakness of the feet, losing the foot arches, maldistributing the pressure, and predisposing the foot to develop repeated trauma-induced injury. Autonomic failure also adds to the burden by diminishing or altering the blood flow and the skin texture and moisture, all of which are risk factors for trauma and infections, which can end up in limb loss and even in uh, loss of life through severe sepsis. The key point I want to highlight here is that symptoms of diabetes complications happen only when the disease is well and advanced. Therefore, we cannot wait until symptoms of retinopathy, neuropathy, or nephropathy would develop. We have to screen the patients with diabetes. And if it is, more, in most occasions, we have to start screening right at the time of diagnosis, and this has to continue at least annually. Let us move fast forward 50 years down the line we find our patient presenting to a medical casualty with acute severe chest pain. He's in, heart, uh, he's in cardiogenic shock with a low blood pressure. An ECG shows ST elevations all over the precordial lead, suggesting an extensive anterior myocardial infarction, which is confirmed by massively increased, the tro increased troponin I. Didn't we know it was coming? We knew. We knew there was endothelial injury going on. We knew. Uh, that atherosclerotic plaques were building up. And we, all, we also knew that one fine day, a plaque is going to rupture, block a vessel, 
and and in, in uh, result in such a potentially life threatening consequence could the story have been any different at 20 years when we knew he had family history of diabetes and he was obese we knew diabetes he was at increased risk of getting diabetes and when he showed the pre diabetic phase blood glucose values and reported us that he has started smoking we knew he was progressing to diabetes and adding to that his endothelial is receiving a double hit and sometime later when the blood glucose levels were off target we knew the hyperglycemia is damaging the endothelium and some years down the line when we saw microalbuminuria and high ldl well recognized risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases we predicted that one day he would end up in a myocardial infarction which could even be the end of his life if we could if we had the opportunity to work with the patient and address those risk factors perhaps the story might have been a little different moving on to the next segment what we have to understand is the key to diabetes pathogenesis is beta cell dysfunction it is the final common pathway in pathogenesis the patient that we uh, that you listen to the story of the patient that you listen to had type 2 diabetes it was dominated by insulin resistance and the body tried to compensate at at one point the beta cells failed or gave up resulting in hyperglycemia so what defines or what causes this beta cell failure or dysfunction in type 2 diabetes excess adiposity releases free fatty acids into the circulation these are toxic to the beta cells in the pancreas this is what we call lipotoxicity as the glucose starts to climb up in the blood blood in the blood circulation even before it reaches the diabetes diagnosing threshold this rise in blood glucose itself is also toxic to the beta cells and this is what we call glucotoxicity the glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity will suppress the beta cell function and if these two metabolic stressors persist the beta cells will succumb the beta cells will die and that is the point of no return so the key message here is in type 2 diabetes the cause of beta cell dysfunction and death is glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity or in other words the metabolic stress on a different day we would see a different patient with a different story this 14 year old girl came to us with rapid weight loss thirst and polyuria all happening just over 3 weeks and for one day she had abdominal pain and vomited several times when we checked the blood glucose the uh, the random plasma glucose was 450 mg per dl and she was having metabolic acidosis with a venous ph of 7.10 and when we tested serum ketone bodies that was remarkably positive she has presented in diabetic ketoacidosis and we all know what the diagnosis is that is type 1 diabetes how is it different from type 2 pathogen from a pathogenic point of view the key difference is we heard that beta cell injury or dysfunction in type 2 diabetes is driven by the glucolipotoxicity but in type 1 diabetes it is driven by autoimmune injury the cell mediated immunity will act to destroy the beta cells and look at this difference in type 2 diabetes the decrease in beta cell function was gradual over years and decades but in type 1 diabetes this is very rapid the destruction is very rapid and nearly complete therefore they present the short history of symptoms and by the time they present almost all of the beta cells are dysfunctional or dead and gone and they present in severe hyperglycemia and because of the very low or absolute insulin deficiency even the ketogenic mechanisms are not suppressed so they lead to diabetic ketoacidosis so the key differences in type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes 
Type 2, there is marked adiposity metabolic syndrome and metabolic stress, which drives the beta cell dysfunction and death. They do not show anti-GED 65 antibodies. These are anti-glutamic acid decarboxylase 65 antibodies because there is no autoimmunity as such in type 2 diabetes. And as you can see, by the time they present with hypoglycemia, they still have insulin C peptide production in the body. So they are sometimes high, higher than normal, or at least within the normal range for an otherwise normal individual. And diabetic ketoacidosis is quite very rare in type 2 diabetes. That is because um, uh, there is some beta cell function less left even in the advanced stages, unlike in type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, where there is absolute destruction of beta cells. So adiposity and metabolic syndrome or metabolic stress is a less of a problem in type 1 diabetes that is characterized by autoimmune injury, which is marked by the presence of anti 65 antibodies. And by the time they present, there is hardly any detectable C peptide or insulin in the circulation, and they're at very high risk of DKA because of absolute insulin deficiency. Type 1 and type 2 are not the only mechanisms of diabetes. There are other types. Gestational is one such type, which is uh, due, because during pregnancy, particularly towards the mid and latter parts of the pregnancy, the body's insulin resistance goes up. So that can lead to a relative deficiency of insulin and precipitate diabetes. And there are other types like monogenic diabetes, which is a result of abnormalities or aberrations in insulin production and secretion in the beta cells. As you can see, there are numerous processes uh, that need to function synchronously. If anything is out of place or dysfunctional, that can result in beta cell dysfunction leading to insulin deficiency and diabetes. Cushing syndrome, we all know, causes central obesity. There is gain of adiposity and very high insulin resistance. Again, somewhat similar to diabetes type 2, but it is distinct in itself because pushing by itself is a recognized separate disease. Chronic pancreatitis, as we all can understand, will damage the beta cells in the pancreas, and this can result in uh, loss of beta cell function and therefore diabetes. That's all I, what I wanted to tell you all this morning. I hope I have given you this four key messages. If you could take these four key messages, I think I have achieved a lot this morning. Diabetes is driven by beta cell dysfunction, which progresses to beta cell death. Its mechanism differs in type one diabetes, which is purely autoimmune, and in type two diabetes, which is driven by metabolic stress, the glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity, and in other types like monogenic diabetes, where there is inherent dysfunction genetically determined dysfunction of beta cells. Long term, irrespective of the type of diabetes, if it lasts long, hypoglycemia will drive the endothelial injury, but it has important co-players like hypertension, dyslipidemia, and smoking. We have to identify those reversible risk factors and reverse them if we are to prevent the endothelial injury, the vascular damage, and the spectrum of macrovascular and microvascular complications. Third key message is symptoms of complications are seen only when the disease is advanced. And at that stage, there is not much that we could do. That is why we have to screen all patients with diabetes, even right from the start of the disease to detect this early. And finally, Diabetes is preventable if you identify the risk factors on time and correct them. It is treatable if you focus on the goals and choose the correct agent and strategies, which are going to listen in the coming few talks for today. But are we really addressing the core problem of beta cell dysfunction? All we try to do is correct the risk factors and get the glucose under control. Have we thought about restoring beta cell dysfunction? I leave that for you to think and for, uh, read for uh, and expand your knowledge. Thank you so much for listening. I hope I gave you something to think about and uh, read and expand your knowledge on. But if you have any questions, I would be more than happy and delighted to answer. I actually have a question in the chat which says, 
So does that mean it is wrong to call type 2 diabetes as insulin resistant diabetes as blood glucose rises above the thresholds only once there is absolute insulin deficiency? Well, I do not say that there is absolute insulin deficiency. When the insulin resistance is high, the body tries to compensate that by producing more and more insulin. But at one point, the capacity of insulin production will be exceeded by the insulin resistance. So at this point, there is no absolute insulin deficiency. The body still produces insulin. Insulin is produced, in fact, in larger amounts than a non-diabetic person. But that amount of insulin produced is not enough to overcome the resistance, which means there's a relative insulin deficiency. So I do not say, so the deficiency of insulin is, is in type 2 diabetes onset is not absolute. But of course, as the disease progresses over decades, the beta cells will die, and then that will result in absolute insulin deficiency. Uh, so I hope I answered the question. Does that mean it is wrong to call type 2 diabetes as insulin resistant diabetes? Well, it is, you can call type 2 diabetes as as characterized by insulin resistance uh, and, and, uh, and the mechanism of beta cell dysfunction, however, is the metabolic stress, the glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity, which in fact are part and parcel of the diabetes resistance, the insulin resistance. So there's another question asking neuropathy, retinopathy occurs simultaneously or after one another. In general, they would start simultaneously, but uh, there is a wide variation from one patient to the other. But generally, we, we, we generally believe that when diabetes nephropathy or proteinuria sets in, by that time, there is usually diabetic retinopathy and typically even proliferative stages of retinopathy. And there are still also could be neuropathy, which might still be clinically silent, but if you do more advanced studies, you will detect neuropathy. So in general, when you find somebody to have manifestations of one microvascular complication, more often than not, we will have the other microvascular complications as well. I think in the absence of other questions, I can hand it over to Nipun. Uh, thank you, Hasha. Thank you very much. Uh, you made an excellent presentation. It was a very uh, uh, clear, basic introduction for uh, all our, uh, the doctors who are still at the initial stages or the medical students who are still at the initial stages of the medical curricula. So I think you made the things clear. I'm very glad, grateful to you if you just could wait because they start putting questions after your lecture so that if you could think, uh, be checking the chat box and uh, be kind enough to answer their questions. So we'll move on to our next presentation. Okay. Our next presentation is by Dr. Nipun Lakshita de Silva, lecturer in medicine, faculty of medicine, General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. He would talk to us on lifestyle interventions in management of diabetes and treatment targets. So it's over to you, Nipun. Uh, thank you, madam, for the kind introduction. Uh, I would like to thank SLMA, uh, SLC and SLDA for uh, giving me the opportunity to present today. Uh, and uh, thank you, Harsha, for the excellent start and uh, making the platform, setting the platform uh, for me to uh, build on that. So we have listened to an unfortunate story of a young man who uh, had problems with diabetes. Let us uh, look at this fellow whom most of you will know, Basi Mark from the world famous cricketer. He was diagnosed to have diabetes, type 1 diabetes, at the age of 29 to 30 years. Now he's 55 years, having a successful journey in his cricket life and personal life. So listening uh, and uh, uh, making a lot of world records in cricket. So he's a world legend today in cricket. So listening to his success stories, he nicely tells the world that he had been making sure that he was following a good lifestyle intervention from the day he was diagnosed to have type 1 diabetes. And also that he was very keen on achieving the treatment targets. Let us see how we can uh, try our patients also to achieve uh, success stories through a good lifestyle interventions and uh, achieving targets. So my talk, I will uh, focus on two main areas. The first being lifestyle interventions. 
uh, where I will be discussing about medical nutrition therapy, physical activity, smoking and alcohol cessation. Then we will uh, briefly look at how we could help our patients to achieve these healthy lifestyle changes. The second part would be on treatment targets, where I will be discussing on blood glucose, pressure and lipid targets. Moving on to medical nutrition therapy, first what we have to realize is we plan our medical nutrition therapy to help our patients to achieve a healthy body weight. It could be weight loss in an obese or an overweight person or maintaining a normal weight in a, uh, the person who is already in normal weight. Uh, similarly, we want to achieve glycemic control and other metabolic targets like lipids, uh, blood pressure, and uh, if there is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, acid and addressing them. So we, uh, our medical nutrition therapy should focus on those aspects. How we are going to do that? Remember that you have to personalize this to your patient. We have to recognize our patient, his cultural background, understanding, and the availability and affordability of food. Unless we make a uh, diet plan that helps our patient who can sustain it, it's very unlikely that patient will be continuing that. So uh, sometimes, you know, nowadays there are financial issues and availability issues. So if you don't understand those things and give up an uh, impractical plan, obviously it's not going to work for our patient. Uh, understanding the health diet patterns. Now, there are different ways of eating patterns people use. Uh, there is no strict criteria that one is better than the other, but what we have to understand is uh, the health, uh, this uh, healthy plate model is one such model where Sri Lankans have been using for all last few decades. The benefit of this is it is uh, made in a way that it's very understandable for the patient and uh, Pictorially, it tells you what uh, how to have a healthy diet. Therefore, our patients uh, find it very helpful. If you look at it, the plate, we advise the patient to have about half as uh, vegetables, non-starch vegetables, and part of uh, starch or the carbohydrate, and one part as protein-containing food. So, if you can uh, convert it to a normal uh, Sri Lankan diet, this would be a mixed meal where you have this composition, uh, which is quite healthy. Uh, out of the non-starchy vegetables, there are many in Sri Lanka. Remember uh, to tell your patients things like yams, uh, potatoes, uh, jackfruit, breadfruit. They are not true vegetables as such. If they want to eat them really, what they have to do is cut down a bit of their rice or the other starch content. Now, uh, other important thing that you have to rem remind them is if uh, better not to use a lot of coconut milk, coconut oil in processing. Use minimal processing. Try to have salads then uh, boiled vegetables, steamed vegetables, so as much as possible to make it unaltered, which is, uh, preserves their taste as well as the nutrition value. There are a lot of concerns about the carbohydrate in our meal. People are uh, obsessed a lot about the type of carbohydrate, whether they do it bread, rice, white rice, red rice, basmati, whatever. But what we want to tell them is, when you take it in a mixed meal, as we showed them, the impact of individual carbohydrate con com uh, food is minimal whether though you uh, cite glycemic index for individual red rice and white rice when you have a proper mixed meal it it is immaterial to the patient so let them enjoy whatever carbohydrate containing food they want but in a healthy composition uh, meal a plate like this then they can enjoy whether they want rice rice bread uh, whatever they like another important thing you will see in this picture is the legumes now remember people were you uh, referring to legumes as protein rich food yes it has protein but it has a lot of carbohydrates even higher than the proteins therefore uh, if they are going to take these legumes as curries with their rice or other carb containing food it will increase the carb quantity in their food but if they are going to have either cowpea or chickpea or uh, green uh, grams in the morning as a breakfast in isolation that would give a balance of protein and carbohydrate both. So let them understand this concept. Uh, otherwise, people will misunderstand this as them having a lot of proteins in their meal. Other important components in your food, definitely protein containing food. They can have fish, eggs, chicken, and uh, uh, less fat containing meats, uh, and things like soya, which also do, does not have much uh, uh, fat or carbohydrate. They can select a lot of healthy fat con uh, uh, com uh, containing food. It is important for them to understand fat is also an important composition in our food, but healthy fat, which means mostly unsaturated fat, like poly and mono unsaturated fat. For example, avocados, nuts like cashew nut, peanut, 
fish, they have a lot of healthy food, uh, fat. Similarly, if you take olive oil, sunflower oil, soya oil, canola oil, they have relatively high quantity of unsaturated fat. Then the uh, next important thing is uh, moving on to fruits. Now, people are a bit worried about food when it comes to diabetes, but let them understand they can have about two portions per day better between meals rather than half with the main meal. So if they can have a fruit at a snack, that's better. Relatively, bananas, uh, 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 papaya, pineapple, mango-like food, fruits have higher quantity of sugars. But they can have a higher amount of fruits like amarella, uh, veralu, nelly, and guava. So uh, let them have uh, enjoy those fruits more, but still they can have other fruits about two portions a day. But uh, better if they can separate it from their main meal. So the amount of carb they take throughout the day uh, is distributed without causing rapid uh, surges of blood glucose. So with that knowledge, they can probably go make their own plate like this. It's just what they were available on, at their home, making it to a healthy plate. It's not that difficult and it's not expensive. So tell them, give them examples. If they want to have fried rice, let them make fried rice at home with more vegetables, with a, a huge amount of vegetables cut into small pieces. They can have kotu, they can have pitu roti with vegetables. Uh, so those are the options they can think of. Uh, be innovative and help them to develop a uh, meal plan that suits them. So this is in contrast to our traditional plates where there is a lot of carbohydrate and uh, things like uh, uh, coconut and coconut milk. So there you will realize there is hardly any uh, non-starchy vegetables or protein healthy, not only for a person with diabetes or anyone. So they have to realize there is no diabetic diet as such. It's just that they have to have a healthy meal. Uh, I didn't talk about things to not to eat at the beginning. Whenever you start with not to eat, to your patient, they feel disheartened and frustrated. Tell them that there are plenty of things for them to eat. But at the end, you also tell them better to cut down their sugar, cut down their salt a bit, and avoid unhealthy fat like cheese, butter, uh, the coconut oil and coconut uh, milk, and avoid deep frying. Deep frying is anyway unhealthy for any individual. So those are simple things that they can, you can tell your patient, uh, patient with diabetes to improve their uh, diet. Moving on to physical activity, they should understand that physical activity and exercises are two different things. Any movement in your body causing energy requirement is a physical activity, but if you do a structured activity that is beneficial for your health, it is considered an exercise. Both of them are beneficial, but definitely exercises are much more important. If a person with diabetes engages in regular exercise, they can have better glycemic control, better blood pressure and lipid control. Not only that, it improves their cardiovascular endurance, fitness, muscle functions, and not, uh, they particularly get a better deal to their bones. You know, with the aging and with diabetes, their bone health declines and they can develop osteoporosis. That can be prevented by regular exercise. And it, diabetes, uh, regular exercise also prevents all microvascular and macrovascular complications, including ne nephropathy, retinopathy, neuropathy. So tell your patient that these are the benefits of exercise, not just cutting down your blood sugar. So what are the exercises you would recommend to your patient? You start with aerobic exercises like walking, jogging, brisk walking, swimming, cycling. So those are the regular exercises they can do. Not only that, you, you should tell them, keep away from sedentary activity. If you are uh, just seated on a uh, chair, you have to stand up from 30 minutes, stand up every 30 minutes and go at least five minutes for crown. So in their day-to-day -day life also, if, whenever they are not doing exercise, they can have physical activity like climbing flight of stairs, avoiding screen time, uh, standing up from chair uh, at every 30 minutes as I told, and also engaging in household calls and gardening. So those are simple ways for them to stay active in addition to their regular exercise. So how much of regular exercise they should do? About 30 minutes per day for five days a week, which amounts about 150 minutes of things like brisk walking, jogging, cycling, or swimming. That is moderate intensity exercise. Then we move on to resistance exercises or muscle strengthening. Now people have a myth that they need to go to a gym to do these exercises. Definitely not. If you have devices, you can use them. You can use weights, you can use circuits like machines, you can use resistant bands. These can be useful to engage in regular strength, 
training exercises. But if you don't have any of them, you use your own body weight. You do push-ups, crunches, planks, dips. All of them are resistance exercises. So you can just do it at home. Anybody can do. It's just that we have to assist them whether they are fit enough to undergo. If so, you ask them to do about two to three sessions a week. A session means about uh, five sets of different ones. In one set, you will do about 10 repetitions. So if you do dips, you do about 10 to 15 dips. Then uh, 10 to 15 plants, 10 to 15 crunches, crunches. Likewise, you do about five sets, uh, two to three sessions a week. The next type is flexibility and balance. This is particularly important for elderly. We ask them to do about two to three times a day. They can even do things like yoga. This is very important to prevent their falls and keep them mobile uh, for a longer period. So those are the types of exercises you tell them. So we have talked about medical nutrition and exercises. Then we have to tell them, advise them to stop their smoking and alcohol. Now, okay, we know what we should tell them. How are we going to incorporate into a patient's life? The difficult part is changing a behavior of someone's life is not that easy, but they have been doing so far. So we have to first recognize our patient characteristics, whether the patient is obese, having hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Then we recognize other factors, whether he's going to work, whether he has money to buy whatever we tell, whether he's doing night shifts, uh, those things. So the surrounding factors that would impact our plan. Then we make a shared plan. Remember, you educate the patient, but you do not force fully give a plan. You educate the patient, you give a self-support, empower the person to make a plan. So he will tell, I want to lose 10% of my weight. I want to walk every day 30 minutes in the evening. Other one will tell, I don't have time to walk 30 minutes a day. I will do in 10 uh, 10, uh, 10 minutes each uh, treat after main three meals. So let them come up with their plan. If they come up with their plan, then you fine tune it and agree on a plan. Then you implement it and relieve the patient in few months' time. And you realize the patient might be doing well, but always the story is not like that. If they can't find it difficult, they might have stopped doing certain things. Don't be uh, 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 harsh to the patient, don't be judgmental. Be always positive. Let them recognize his strengths and weaknesses and improve the plan and review on a new plan. So this is how we move on a cycle when we are dealing with patients with diabetes. Remember them, it's a lifetime disease most of the time. So let them handle it positively without being so judgmental or critical. So with that previous traditional approach of having a restrictive uh, diet to a person with diabetes, now we have been more positive with facilitating your patient to and empowering patient to mod modify their life to a healthy one. So that is the current uh, approach we would recommend. So with that, we would move, move to the second objective of my talk today, that is about treatment targets. So the standard target which everyone talks about is uh, pre-meal about 80 to 130 milligrams per deciliter. After a meal, two hours, we talk about 180 less than NHB1C of less than 7%. But remember your patient, he's not always the same. You will see a 30% 30-year-old male who was just diagnosed without any comorbidities and fit and very well motivated. You will go for 66.5 HbA1c. So if you have a long shorter duration, increased life expectancy without any comorbidities, it's easy. And if the person can have low blood glucose targets without hypoglycemia, always offer them to have a strict control because they are going to have better long-term benefit and you might have heard the term called metabolic memory long term it helps but if you have a patient who is having multiple comorbidities with limited expectancy and already established complications and if you are on multiple drugs and if you are going to add the drug that causes hypoglycemia don't think about no, 6.5 and think of 8 that's okay so individualize your target if you are looking after a person with palliative care, disseminated malignancy, don't talk about HbA1c targets. Talk about making sure blood sugar is less than 200 so that he won't be dehydrated or getting up at night to pass the urine to the urine. That's all. So you individualize your patient and give them a comfortable plan for blood glucose. Similarly, our blood pressure also should be individualized. Most of the people with high cardiovascular risk, we better we try to have a target of about 130 to 80, 130 by 80. If they have already cardiovascular disease or if they have high risk of developing a cardiovascular disorder, by after calculating the risk using standard calculators, you can have a uh, high, 
a more stringent blood pressure control. But if the cardiovascular risk is lower, or if the, you are dealing with a, an older adult with risk of postural hypotension and falls, better to be a bit less stringent. So that is the idea what you have to understand. Be individualized in your goals. If it's also similar. Now, when you look at the last 10 years, we have been coming down more and more with when it comes to lipids. We have talking about 100, 70, 55. So what you have to realize is diabetes is already a strong risk factor for cardiovascular disease. With that, if they already have cardiovascular disease or target damage like nephropathy or multiple problems like high old age, obesity, smoking, we have to be strict on their LDL targets. Better to lower uh, target to something like 55. If your patient is not having already established cardiovascular disease or target organ damage like nephropathy, retinopathy, neuropathy, but having a long duration of diabetes and other risk factors like age, hypertension, and uh, obesity, you might be a bit more uh, uh, less stringent. But if there is nothing short duration of diabetes, young patient, you might go for a target of LDL less than 100. You might see all these targets are a bit stringent, but this is the way we are moving because clearly LDL is associated with cardiovascular risk and diabetes is a double bird uh, and diabetes and high LDL is a double bird for these patients. So those are the targets we are going to talk about in our patients, blood glucose, uh, pressure and lipids. Again, we realize rather than talking about one rigid target, when your patient enters to the clinic, we don't tell your HbA1c should be this. We assess our patient and develop individualized targets. So this is the current approach. For that, you have to know your patient well and understand how well you can go on achieving these targets. So with that, we go for an individualized target. With that, let me come to the end of my presentation. Remind, remind your patient they can have a pleasurable eating even if they have diabetes. There is nothing called diabetic diet. Let them enjoy their food on the proper composition and balanced meal. If so, they will be enjoying the pleasure of eating while achieving their glycemic and other metabolic targets. And let them be active. Always encourage them to have an active, happy life so that uh, they would be uh, fit for a longer time. And set your goals to your individual patient with your patient so that the chances of achieving these goals are much higher. With that, I come to the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and thank you very much for your kind uh, uh, listening. Uh, thank you very much, Nipun, uh, Dr. Nipun De Silva, uh, for that excellent, comprehensive, very clear presentation on diet, exercise, and the lifestyle uh, modification to control or to prevent diabetes mellitus. The, uh, there's a question that they want to know that what exercises are not suitable for patients with diabetic retinopathy and autonomic neuropathy? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the question. Diabetic retinopathy, uh, uh, if it is uh, early stages, anyway, there is no restriction. When they have proliferative advanced diabetic retinopathy, uh, there's sometimes very high, uh, high uh, intensity strength, strengthening exercises might be a bit harmful, particularly if it increases the uh, pressure, uh, ocular pressures. So things like straining. They are, what we tell is if there is advanced retinopathy or things like autonomic neuropathy, we might do a pre-exercise assessment by a trained individual and recommend them. There is no uh, uh, also. Then for, when it comes to autonomic neuropathy, again, if there is definite evidence of postural hypotension or uh, resting uh, tachycardia or uh, absent uh, rate variations, we might again start them slowly. It's not that uh, there is contraindication for exercises. They need uh, gradual initiation of exercises and with starting exercises definitely it improves their autonomic neuropathy also. So the, the, actually it needs a multimodal treatment. So slowly we start them for people with autonomic neuropathy. Uh, thank you, um, Nipun. Uh, the other question is, what about colocander? Does it worsen hyperglycemia? Yes, madam. It depends. Now, uh, it had been a uh, common question all the time. What people tell is, uh, first thing, if they can have that amount of green leaves whenever possible in a, a, a salad or a maluma, it's much better because we have the 
uh, fiber and other nutrients in uh, uh, green leaves when we take like that from, because when we make the colacanda we throw away most of the uh, nutritious one so whether it increases blood glucose depends on how we make it one with how much of rice we add and how much of coconut milk we add so if we use a lot of uh, uh, green leaves and less amount of uh, with water and less amount of coconut and carb, uh, rice it might be okay but the problem is sometimes people use a lot of uh, uh, coconut milk and rice then definitely it will give a lot of calories for an obese or overweight person with diabetes definitely we do not recommend colacanda but if the person's weight is normal they might take a bit uh, if they prepare it with a lot of uh, 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 green leaves but again it's, it is not additionally beneficial sometimes people think colacanda is a very good food it probably it doesn't have additional benefit if people like it they can take it occasionally when it, it is prepared properly uh, is intermittent fasting beneficial for obese non-diabetic individuals <laughs> All this uh, for them. That, that's why we organize. Yes, it. madam. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Again, uh, now the answer to that, what we tell is we do not ourselves recommend them to go for uh, intermittent fasting, but we come across a lot of people who are on intermittent fasting. What we do is it again is one eating pattern, like we recommend our health healthy plate pattern there are other eating ways one is keto diet one is intermittent fasting so if they find it comfortable to do that there is so far no evidence to say it is harmful and some people achieve weight loss with intermittent fasting so they can do it uh, but for non-obese again it's a bit difficult to follow up and for people on complex insulin regimes definitely it's not recommended for other people if they want to do it we can support them but the experience in all all over the world is most of these other meeting patterns like keto diet, intermittent fasting, they relapse and go back to an unhealthy diet. So that's why we try to have a more flexible and simpler diet, which they can eat for years. Uh, what is the role of coconut oil and coconut milk in diabetes? Uh, Madam, again, uh, now, uh, if we look at the composition, coconut oil has a very high amount of saturated fat compared to other oil types. Uh, compared to olive oil, canola oil, soya oil, uh, and uh, uh, olive, uh, uh, gingerly oil. But definitely, uh, this so-called vegetable oil in the market, the palm oil definitely is not superior. There is no doubt about that because it also has saturated fat. But if uh, now problem is Sri Lanka has a lot of coconut oil. Uh, what we recommend tell is now, uh, there is, uh, uh, when you look at the literature, what they have shown is usually coconut compared to coconut oil other oil types are better because it has saturated polyan and monounsaturated fatty acids which improves their uh, lipids uh, uh, overall but the problem is those studies done in other countries are mostly on people who use this oil without much heating they add them to salads so we do not have direct evidence to say whether these fat when they do a lot of frying and cooking whether they remain uh, remain the health benefits because sometimes there is a theoretical chance these unsaturated fat get modified when we are eating so that is the worry but overall what we recommend is uh, minimize as much as possible coconut oil and coconut milk minimize them and also definitely avoid deep frying whether to uh, whether we are recommending people to change from uh, coconut oil to other oil types usually as a, uh, most of the time, we try to keep silent because there are a lot of practical concerns, cost, and Sri Lanka has only coconut oil. So if someone is happy to you go for an alternative oil type and not going to heat it a lot and deep fry it, it's perfectly okay to use alternative oils rather than coconut oil or coconut milk. Uh, this is the last question, uh, Nikon. The, uh, is artificial sweetness harmful? Definitely, uh, what they say is it's not harmful, madam, because if a person who wants to have sweet taste, instead of uh, caloric sweetener like sugar, if they use artificial sweeteners, which are called non-caloric sweeteners, uh, the total quantity of uh, amount uh, uh, calorie they take will cut down. So it will somehow help the person to uh, reduce the amount of calorie they take. But 
uh, having said that, if we look at all the international guidelines, including what we recommend in Sri Lanka, we start telling, art, we don't recommend, it, uh, recommend artificial sweetness. The idea is uh, we try our pay, uh, person and as a community to go away from this sweet taste. So we tell if you want to have a tea, have a tea without sugar. That's perfectly okay. That's what we overall try to change, uh, Im implement in the community. And if they try to tell, drink more water rather than sweeten ju uh, juices or ju uh, drink the juice without adding sugar. So because of that, uh, because we want to make a cultural change, we do not recommend, not only us, even the international guidelines clearly say, we do not recommend sweetness. That's why I didn't mention that. But if a person who finds it very difficult to stay away from the sweet taste, wants to use an artificial non-nutritive sweetener instead of sugar, that won't be harmful. Uh, thank you very much, Nipun, Dr. Nipun Lakshita De Silva, for that excellent presentation and with very basic uh, information uh, on lifestyle interventions in the management of diabetes and treatment targets. I'm certain that you added so much for the knowledge, building up knowledge among medical students as well as the medical officers in this country. Thank you, Nipun. I'm very grateful to you. If you could visit the chat box and answer their sure. other questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So for us yeah. to move on to our next presentation, our next presentation is pharmacotherapy of diabetes uh, options, um, diabetes one options and choices of non-insulin therapies. Uh, that would be addressed by Dr. Sachi Tabiratna, consultant endocrinologist and senior lecturer in pharmacology, University of Colombo. Sachi, over to you. Thank you, madam, for that introduction. Uh, yeah, share my slides. I uh, hope my slides are visible. Yes, yes, such as yes. Okay, thank you, madam. Okay, so uh, uh, what I'm going to do uh, in this lecture would be a uh, bit an uh, update on these uh, medicines because I'm sure in your medical faculties, you all have learned a lot about these uh, conventional treatment we use. Uh, so I'll go through uh, all of these medicines which we use for the, the treatment of diabetes, the non insulin medicines. Uh, then we can compare a little bit about these old versus new, what are the differences. Uh, and then I'll also cover other injectable therapies other than insulins we, we use in the treatment of diabetes. Uh, for the new treatment, I will discuss a little bit detail about their mechanism of actions as well, because some of them are uh, quite new. And then finally, I will give you an idea how you could select different treatment uh, based on their pros and cons. So that is going to be a uh, kind of outline of my presentation. Now, uh, if you look at this slide, uh, I'm sure you uh, have uh, learned about a little bit about pathophysiology as well. Uh, now, if you look at this slide, it summarizes uh, main uh, cardio, uh, main uh, diabetic trials which uh, have been done in the past uh, years. And then you may have heard about these famous trials, UKBDS and the DCCT trials. So UKBDS in type 2 diabetes, DCCT trial in type 1 diabetes. Now what I want to show you is uh, all of these trials have shown that if you have good glycemic control, you are going to have less uh, microvascular complications, that is your kidneys, eyes, as well as nerve problems, those are going to be less. But if you look at the second column, you can see even with the good glycemic control, which uh, they achieve in most of these trials, your macrovascular benefits and your mortality, uh, that is reduction of deaths uh, with diabetes, it's not so great. So they are like 50-50, uh, they're not like the uh, microvascular benefits. So this highlights the uh, important fact, which is uh, the connection between microvascular complications and diabetes is very straightforward. So if you lower your glucose, maintain it, you are going to reduce those complications. But macrovascular, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, although some trials have shown that macro, uh, good glycemic control also will help you uh, reduce your microvascular complication later on. Some other trials have not. So it's a little bit tricky or gray area. 
So which uh, leaves us that we need medicines other than which lowers glucose control, we, we need medicines which lower the cardiovascular mortality as well. Uh, and you would know by now that uh, most of our patients with diabetes, they die due to these cardiovascular complications. In fact, about two thirds of patients will die due to the cardiovascular complications. So that is the reason why we still need, or oh, uh, there is continued effort to find more and more drug therapies. Uh, although we have good therapies to lower blood sugar, uh, that is why people are uh, making new advances to find new therapies so that they can also reduce these macrovascular complications like cardiovascular disease and also reduce the deaths related to diabetes. So with that, uh, I'll go into the, uh, the, the available treatment options. So we have oral and non-insulin injectable therapies for the management of diabetes. So I have listed here, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this treatment. So we have bigonides, those are the metformin group, then sulfonylureas, the commonly used glycoside, glycoclamide, they belong to that. Then thiazolidinodione, those are the pyoglitazone, which is the only current medicine we use. Uh, Meglitonides are uh, not so commonly used. I'll tell you later a little bit about it. And then alpha glucosidase inhibitors, again, not so commonly used uh, with some reasons. And then uh, we have DPP4, some of the new treatments, which are DPP4 inhibitors. Uh, then the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLT1 receptor agonists. So those three are new treatments uh, which have come recently for the management of diabetes. Now, uh, if you compare with the old, very old age, uh, old age, where uh, what they what they use for the treatment of diabetes, you can see they have come a long way now, right? So you can see uh, what they have used at that time. But nowadays, we have much more beneficial medicines to manage diabetes. Now, uh, the different treatment I told you earlier, if you look at they are in terms of uh, HbA1c reduction, so which is, you can take it as efficacy. You can see our uh, good old medicines, which are the metformins, the sulfonylureas, they still have a very good efficacy. There's no issue about it, right? So they reduce uh, sugars in the range of about 1.5 to 2 percent. And anything which uh, does better than that, it would be insulin. Uh, otherwise, it is almost a uh, very good uh, amount of reduction. And then some of the newer treatment, uh, even thiazolid indions, they have a good HbA1c lowering. And the newer, out of newer treatment, you can notice that this GLP-1 receptor agonist coming close to that level. Whereas the other new treatment, uh, you can notice that the HbA1c lowering is less than the established treatment. So if you just concentrate on reducing blood sugar. The metformin, sulfonylureas remain to be the best because we have experience. We have, uh, we know about their side effects uh, and and uh, they are cheap as well when you compare with the new treatment. Um, yeah. So the all the other ones like alpha glucosidase inhibitors, their efficacy is lower than. Uh, the uh, established treatment like metformin and sulfonylurea. So out of new treatment, GLP-1 receptor agonist seems to be a uh, one which comes close to that level. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to uh, bicornite. So this is not going to be a typical pharmacology lecture because uh, you'll have done your pharmacology. This is a little bit telling you some important points about these medicines. So bicornite, you know, uh, we have metformin, and uh, metformin still remains, after a long time, still remains the uh, number one drug when you come to treatment of diabetes. So wherever in the world, all the guidelines will recommend that if they're diagnosed with diabetes, irrespective of whether they are obese or not, they should be started on metformin. Now, uh, if you are interested why, uh, despite of all these new treatments, why it still remains in this, uh, uh, the number one position, yeah, the, the answer lies there where it goes and change one of these important cellular pathways which is involved with diabetes, obesity, and all these cellular pathways. So I'm sure you remember your pharmacology. This is the AMPK pathway, right? So it goes and activate the AMPK pathway. 
so thereby it improves the insulin sensitivity and uh, by doing that it reduces glucose hepatic glucose output uh, reduce glucose absorption uh, from the gut uh, and also improve the peripheral insulin sensitivity that is all through this simulation of AMPK pathway so this is a weight neutral drug it's a very low cost drug i mean uh, relatively out from what is available and the problem is that sometimes patients get gi side effects commonly and uh, what we will do to prevent that is low titration administer them after meals and uh, some rare patients we sometimes consider extended release preparations uh, so other than that the lactic acidosis risk is very very rare but it becomes important if there is renal impairment or major organ impairment so unless patient has any major organ impairment renal impairment for the degree of around uh, 30 uh, estimated gfr uh, that level you can use it safely uh, B12 absorption can happen, but not an uh, immediate side effect. It's a long-term side effect. Now, metformin and uh, the, the hotly debated topic, which is the uh, cardiovascular safety. Uh, now, there are some evidence from this UKPDS trial that metformin lowers uh, cardiovascular risk in obese patients. But we didn't have any endpoint uh, specifically designed trials with metformin because it's a old drug, only the new drugs underwent that kind of testing. So uh, there's some evidence to say it is cardioprotective and it has a lot of other benefits. It acts on the AMPK pathway. It may reduce certain malignancies. So all these things with the low cost weight neutrality uh, and uh, we know the side effects fairly safe in most of the patients because of that, it remains number one agent. Yeah. Uh, one thing you have to consider is if there's renal impairment, then it uh, should be used in portion, contraindicated below, estimated GFR of less than 30. Between 30 and 45, it is not recommended to newly start it. If the patients are on it, you might have to lower the dose a little bit and continue, but at 30, you stop it. Um, and generally, you need to check your the patient's uh, kidney functions when the patient is on these drugs. Uh, below 45, you have to be cautious, and below 30, you will stop it. And then one thing to remember, metformin, uh, when you use it uh, with iodinated contrast, you know that iodinated contrast agents, especially if they are given intraarterial ones like these angiograms, etc., uh, they can actually go and damage the kidneys, or I mean, it, they can affect the kidney functions, it can lead into a bit of renal impairment. So, there in that situation, it may be tricky to use metformin. So generally what we advise is if the patients are undergoing uh, these procedures, uh, which needs identity contrast agents, we stop metformin at least 24 hours uh, before, and then 48 hours after the procedure, we do the creatinines, and then if there's no issue, we can restart that. And so is uh, before surgery. If the patients are undergoing major surgery, we would like to stop metformin before that time. But most of the other situations, uh, except where well, there's major organ failure like uh, liver disease, heart disease, or severe kidney disease, we would use metformin without any issue. Then sulfonylureas, the second uh, most commonly used group. In Sri Lanka, we have first generation. We, out of that, we have tolbutamide, but these are going out of fashion now, and then we have uh, second generation glipenclamide, glicoside, glipteride, and glipicide. So glipenclamide, you know, it uh, has a very long half-life uh, and therefore it causes more hypoglycemia. And therefore, again, we are not using it that commonly. We use the other short-acting ones. Now they increase insulin secretion. I'm sure you remember the mechanism of action. Uh, some of the issues with sulfonylureas uh, are that they stimulate pancreatic beta cells. Beta cells uh, work a little, um, more than the usual rate and there is that might there's a concern that that might promote uh, beta cell exhaustion and apoptosis so when we use alphanylurea what we see is more than now if you look at this graph you can see metformin more than metformin alphanylurea failure will come earlier so rather than sensitizing agents the secretogogous agents will cause secondary failures early uh, now hypoglycemia is the main issue 
elderly patients, renal impaired patients, uh, irregular meal schedules, you have to be careful, you have to advise them properly how to prevent hyperglycemia. Weight gain is another problem because of the insulin secretion. They are low cost, that's good. Cardiovascular event, again, there has been some concerns, especially with the first generation salmonylurea. So that's why it's going out of fashion most of the time. Uh, second generation salmonylurea, glycoside and glimiparide seems to be safer than uh, the first generation, although we don't have uh, outcome trials just to indicate whether uh, what is their cardiovascular safety, but we have used it for a long time and uh, uh, certain uh, clinical trials have also UKPDS, etc. have shown they are fairly safe, so uh, we don't think they cause excess cardiovascular events, but there were some concerns with the first generation, which we don't use that much now. Then the thiazolidinolones, uh, now it came early, uh, earlier as one of the very promising drug. Uh, again, uh, its mechanism is to reduce the insulin resistance, no hypoglycemia, no renal metabolism can use it there, although fluid retention seems to be a problem uh, that limits use in renal impairment. And then it seems to improve the indirect markers of cardiovascular disease like favorable lipid profile. So there were a lot of uh, interest for this agent in those days, but then they found different, different adverse effects. Because of that, again, uh, the use has been little limited because of adverse effects. They cause weight gain, weight retention, not good in uh, heart failure, renal failure patients. Uh, then it can cause anemia, bone fractures, uh, risk increases, and then a small but rare risk of bladder cancer is there. It seems to be accumulating over period of time. Their cardiovascular effect, one of the agents, the other agent, uh, the uh, paglisone and rosiglitazone. Actually, rosiglitazone was uh, earlier banned because thinking that it increases cardiovascular events, but later that ban was lifted, thinking that uh, may not be a true effect. Uh, paglisone has not shown to increase cardiovascular events, uh, and therefore we are using it. And then some recent trials, I think, uh, little bit of in the stroke areas as well, seems to have little bit benefit. But by and large, because of the other side effects, it is not so commonly used as well. So meglitonides, we don't use it very often in Sri Lanka. It is uh, similar to sulfur and urea, but a very short acting one. Uh, it's not so commonly available and uh, it is costly than most of these medicines. So therefore we don't use it that much. But if you're using that is mainly for a, as a prandial regulator, just to control postprandial blood sugars. Then alpha glucosidase inhibitors, again available, but I showed you that it has a small effect. So we are, we are not going to use it as a primary treatment. We are just going to use it as an add-on treatment, especially in patients with postprandial hyperglycemia. Their mechanism, I'm sure you remember, inhibits the uh, alpha glucosidase enzymes, which breaks down uh, the disaccharides into monosaccharides. Uh, so uh, with that, you get some side effects like fatulence, diarrhea, uh, uh, those ones, so gastric side effects are the most uh, prominent. Therefore, most patients might not tolerate it, especially in high doses. And the advantages are they don't cause hypoglycemia or weight gain. So uh, in patients who particularly have postprandial uh, blood sugar, high blood sugar, you can add in certain patients. Uh, again, not so commonly used because it's a little bit expensive when you compare with the standard. Uh, agents and the HPA1C loading is on the lower side, like 0.5%. Okay, coming to our new treatment now, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors, so sodium glucose 4 transporter 2 inhibitors have grown a lot of potential in recent times. So, you need to know about these medicines. Now, they are common to use uh, in Sri Lanka, not only in diabetes. Now, we have even newer indications have appeared, like even heart failure, they seem to be beneficial irrespective of diabetes. But, uh, uh, but it seems to be a promising drug. Now we have about three uh, uh, drugs in this category, epaglyphosine, canaphoglyphosine, and epaglyphosine. Uh, so I just show you uh, the mechanism of action. As you know, uh, in the kidneys, when the glucose is filtered, about 90% will be absorbed through this HGLT2 transporter. And therefore, and the rest of the 10% will be uh, absorbed later on with the HGLT2. Uh, one transporter, uh, and therefore no glucose will appear in a healthy person. So, uh, uh, so what they do is they uh, they 
concentrate blocker inhibitor for this HDL D2. That means that 90% which is absorbed part of that will not be absorbed there and uh, glucose will be excreted from urine. That is their mechanism. They reduce blood sugar by excreting glucose with urine. So it's a not an insulin dependent mechanism and uh, uh, the body will adjust its insulin uh, secretion based on the blood glucose. So in, on its own, it will not cause hypoglycemia because it doesn't have anything to do with insulin uh, secretion. Now, uh, we, when we remove glucose, you know glucose gives us energy. It's part of calories we are removing. So they, uh, patients get weight reduction. And uh, when you move, remove glucose, along with that, there is an osmotic diuresis. So with that, the volume, uh, blood volume will also reduce. That will help in lowering blood pressure. But the problem with uh, these agents have been, the common problem was the urinary tract infections and genital mycotic infections. Uh, now their efficacy, because uh, it, it needs kidney function to uh, excrete this glucose, efficacy will be reduced if there is kidney impairment. So uh, in patients uh, who have low uh, EGFR below around 30, their efficacy will be low and we don't recommend these drugs to be used when there is significant kidney impairment because they are unlikely to be effective. So some other problems with these agents are they can cause hyperkalemia, they can cause low blood pressure, especially in elderly if they don't take adequate fluids, and they can increase the LDL that we have to watch. Now some of the significant side effects are this euglycemic ketoacidosis. Now patients who are prone to get ketoacidosis, if you use it, they lower the blood sugar and they make uh, patients more prone to get this ketoacidosis and they present with normal blood sugar ketoacidosis. Uh, one or two agents had some additional effects on the clinical trials. So uh, bladder cancer was seen with the dapaglycosine and amputation risk was seen with canaglycosine. So these agents should be avoided in any high risk patients for these conditions. Uh, they are not have to be, I mean, they have not shown to have uh, excess fracture risk, but uh, insignificantly, but there has been a very non-significant risk noted. So maybe worthwhile uh, using it cautiously if you're using it in patients with osteoporosis. Now, their biggest advantage of recent times have been their cardiovascular benefits. Now, they have shown very early stage after starting, they have shown to lower cardiovascular disease in established cardiovascular disease patients, as well as patients with high risk to get cardiovascular disease. So that is one of the important things. I told you in <laughs> early stage that one of the biggest problems we are facing is this cardiovascular risk. Now, this stage, apart from lowering blood sugar, reduce the cardiovascular risk, which gives us additional benefit. And the second most important benefit with these agents are they reduce the progression of proteinuria, diabetic kidney disease, proteinuria, and they reduce the progression into end-stage renal failure. So uh, patients with diabetes who have cardiovascular disease or who has a risk to progressive kidney failure, these would be good agents to use. Then the other important drug category is these incretin drugs. Uh, so incretin, you know, it's a hormone secreted from the gut in response to the meal. And that is why uh, you see a difference between intravenous injection and oral meal. The insulin levels are different. That is the difference is due to this incretin hormone secretion. Now they seem to be affecting many uh, areas of the pathophysiology of diabetes in terms of their reduced appetite, they increase insulin secretion, they reduce glucagon secretion, which increases blood sugar, they lower gastric emptying rates uh, and improve uh, glucose uh, uptake from muscles and reduce glucose production. So many, uh, many mechanisms of action seems to be there. And on top of that, they seem to have cardioprotective effect. So that gives an additional advantage for these incretin hormones. Now, uh, I'm sure you have uh, gone through the basics or physiology of these things. Uh, now, glucagon like peptide is one of these uh, in main incretins, uh, and that is the one uh, which they target. GLP1 uh, is the one uh, they try to mimic by giving these uh, medicines. Now, uh, we can do it in two ways. One is that uh, you can prolong the body's natural secreted incretin, GLP1, and uh, we have a category of drug called uh, dipeptide. 
dial peptidase enzyme O inhibitors. So that enzyme is the one which breaks down GLP. So if you inhibit that, you prolong body's natural GLP. That will increase it to about reasonable level. But then we have other agents which are actually uh, molecular mimics of the GLP-1. They are more strong and more powerful agents. Now, GLP-1 receptor agonists are these, uh, one of these categories. So they are all injectable medicines. Now, I have listed some of the names. Uh, the first three are you have to give daily or twice daily. The last one, the advantages are they are prolonged, they have prolonged action, and they have only uh, need to be given once weekly. So that is very convenient to a patient. And a very interesting development is happening, that is the semaglutide, they are developing a oral form. And that seems to be very promising. And if it comes to market, I'm sure that is going to be a very effective medicine as well. So here I have compared the uh, few, few names, I have listed them uh, and some common doses. I don't want to go through uh, in detail. Uh, so we have GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is more strongly mimics the action. DPP-4 inhibitors, which will also increase to a reasonable level the body's natural GLP-1. Now, uh, if you compare the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist and DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists seem to be strong. They have more beneficial effects. Uh, and the reason being, uh, higher the GLP-1 uh, one level you achieve, you get more of these, uh, I mean, uh, control more of the pathophysiological mechanism. So at a lower level, like DPP-4 inhibitors, they only increase the insulin and reduce glucagon secretion. But higher levels of uh, GLP-1 achieved by GLP-1 receptor agonists, they reduce appetite, reduce food intake, uh, and those things as well. So they reduce weight significantly. So actually, one of these agents, GLP-1, uh, higher dose has been approved as weight reducing medicine. Now, there are some safety concerns. Uh, now, their main complaint is with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, renal impairment, you have to be cautious. Uh, some patients, they can cause severe gastroparesis. Uh, uh, hyperglycemic risk is low unless you use it with other agents. Then the risk will be higher. Then hypersensitive reaction. And uh, some concern about this pancreatitis. Uh, uh, now, uh, pancreatitis I'll tell later. Now, uh, before that, one of the concerns or uh, one of the portions you need to remember, especially uh, using GLP-1 agonist, is this thyroid uh, cancer, especially the medullary type of thyroid cancer. In uh, animal studies, they seem to increase this risk, and therefore, any patient with family history of medullary thyroid cancer, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist should not be used. Uh, Right, uh, so the uh, most important thing why we are uh, we, we are concerned about these agents or we are interested about these agents is they have again like this GLP-2 inhibitors, if you look at just green column for the moment, uh, they have shown that they improve the cardiovascular mortality. So in high risk patient, again, this is a good drug. Although in few drugs, like short acting drugs, they have not shown the effect. All the long acting drugs have shown that they lower the cardiovascular death rates. So that is a good drug like that. The other drug, the DPP-4 inhibitors, which just prolong the body's natural uh, GLP level, it's not so strong like this one. Uh, all the clinical trials showing cardiovascular risk, they have shown that they are cardiovascular neutral. They don't increase it, but they don't decrease it either. So here, the mechanism uh, which I mentioned, they inhibit DPP-4 enzymes and increase the body's natural uh, integrity level. As you can see in this graph, they lower the glucagon, they increase the GLP-1 levels, they lower the glucose and increase the insulin level. So again, like the GLP-1s, they don't cause hypoglycemia or they don't cause any weight gain. They don't lower the weight as well, like the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Few side effects, they can cause upper respiratory tract infections and rarely headache in some patients. Now, cardiovascular uh, outcome I showed you, they are all neutral. They don't lower it or they don't increase it. And all of these DPP-4s need uh, dose modification, except linagliptin, which is uh, excreted in liver. Now, pancreatitis, uh, again, with DPP-4 inhibitors and uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, there was a concern about pancreatitis, but analyzing a lot of data, pancreatitis and the pancreatic cancer risk, now the 
FDA recommends that they actually don't increase it. But in patients with pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer, you have to be cautious using these agents. Right, so uh, this is going to be a busy slide, but I'll go through it quickly with you. Now, we know these uh, different agents available. Now, how are you going to use it? Uh, now, I showed you a few agents which showed uh, beneficial effects in cardiovascular uh, effects. So, uh, if the patient has high cardiovascular risk, now your first line treatment is metformin. After metformin, if you want to, read a, uh, if you want to select a second agent, you should try to select the agent which has shown cardiovascular benefit. So, either you have to select uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP1 receptor agonist. Now, GLP1 receptor agonist in Sri Lanka is not commonly used, it's very costly, uh, these injections, but suppose it might change in future if the oral preparation comes. But SGLT2 inhibitors, now it's kind of a standard of therapy. Any heart disease patient, we use it. Now, what about renal disease? If they have renal disease, uh, you have to be cautious with metformin. Below 30, you don't use it. You have been even using sulfonylurea, you have to be cautious because it can cause hypoglycemia, but low doses can be given. But as a second agent, again, you can consider SGLT2 inhibitor uh, because it has renal protective effects. And then GLP-1 receptor agonists have also shown some renal protective effects. If uh, it's practical to use, that's another agent you can consider. Uh, and then if the cost is a problem, then uh, the agents available would be sulfonylurea and thiazolidinbiones, the pyoglitazones. Uh, uh, but sulfonylurea is commonly used because uh, we know that uh, we have a lot of experience with that agent. So that is a rough guide uh, how we select our second agent uh, when it is there. When the second agent fails, you have to use one of these agents at the third agent probably, but you can also consider insulin, which I'm going to learn in next lecture. So this summarize, which I have told you so far, metformin is the initial pharmacotherapy. Uh, if it is not tolerated, you can add other agents, but then you can also consider insulin treatment. And uh, you have to use early combination therapy to prevent uh, uh, treatment failure as well as increased blood sugar levels causing problems. And any patient coming with very high blood sugars, uh, probably insulin would be a better choice, at least for the initial period. And then uh, after the metformin, you have to use a patient-centered approach, which there you have to consider the cardiovascular risk, renal comorbidities, efficacy, hypoglycemia, weight, uh, and other side effects. And based on that, you can select your second agent. So I think uh, I have given you a brief guide about these new developments and how we are selecting uh, our medicine. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sachit, for that excellent presentation uh, on, uh, I think, oral hypoglycemics uh, uh, for diabetes. Uh, the, uh, so the, uh, um, uh, because that we are, uh, uh, for time, I think that we will try to answer only one question. Uh, is there a place for oral hypoglycemic agents? Uh, no, it's, it's type 1 diabetes. Uh, no, actually, the uh, SGLT tools and those have been uh, in, in experimental level, but uh, at your level, you can remember no place. It's insulin. Uh, and then, whether there is a place for them, any of these, uh, what you described, uh, for uh, weight reduction. Yes, they do. Now, I, I told you briefly that GLP-1 receptor uh, agonists, they cause high levels, so they reduce weight. And actually, the higher dose than what we use in diabetes has been approved as a weight-losing medicine. GLP-1, the liraglutide, has been approved. And the, all the other GLP-1s have shown that effect. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, they reduce weight a little bit, maybe about 3 to 4 kilos maximum, but uh, they're not as efficacious to fall as the weight losing agents, but they lose weight. But your uh, sulfonylureas will increase, your uh, pyoglitazone will increase the weight. Uh, metformin is weight neutral, uh, DPP4 inhibitors are weight neutral. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sachit, on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association and the College of Endocrinologists. Let me 
uh, thank you so much for your contribution towards the uh, knowledge development, building up of knowledge among the uh, our medical professionals as well as medical students. Um, I, I'm very grateful to you if you could uh, visit the chat box and answer the sure. questions of students because there are many questions that I will not have time to pose to you. So our next speaker is uh, actually we have a tea break and uh, let, uh, let us uh, meet again uh, at 10.15. So uh, just have your tea and join with us again at 10.15. Thank you. We'll come back uh, after the, uh, the short tea break for this uh, diabetes update organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists and the Sri Lanka Diabetes Federation. I'm Manil Kasumanathilaka, Vice President of SLMA and uh, chairperson of the Sri Lanka Diabetes Federation. So it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker who needs no introduction among this uh, uh, community, Vidya Jyoti Professor Prasad Katulanda. Uh, he's the professor in medicine at the Colombo uh, Medical School and an honorary consultant for endocrinologist at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. He'll be talking to you on pharmacotherapy, the part two on insulins. Uh, over to you, Prasad, to start your lecture. Thank you, Manilka, and uh, thank you, uh, the organizers, the SLMA and the SLCE and SL uh, Sri Lanka Diabetes Federation for inviting me. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you on insulin therapy. We celebrated, just celebrated 100 years of uh, discovery of insulin by Banting and Best. And this is what happened to uh, particularly type 1 kids who got diabetes um, in the pre-insulin era. They wasted themselves, got ketotic coma, and died. And at that time, there was a time where people were uh, you know, fasted, you know, deprived of food, calories, to uh, prolong the agony of death. Uh, Prasad, excuse me. Yeah, may make a not visible slides. Did you share? Sorry. Uh, Share the screen. Yeah. Can you see now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so we just celebrated 100 years of the discovery of insulin. And this is what happened to the kids uh, before the insulin was discovered. They got wasted, got ketosis, and died. And the people tried various things, including you know, putting them into starvation uh, and restricting calories. Uh, until you know they succumb to the illness and this is the great picture of the discovery where they uh, got a pancreas uh, out of a dog and then um, got that uh, you know, pancreas smashed into you know uh, crushed and got the pancreatic extracted extract and once the pancreas was removed the dog became diabetic and when the extract was re in injected the dog's blood glucose came down that is how they discovered insulin this is that uh, you know methods of the experiment. I'm not going into key details there. And um, once the insulin was uh, you know discovered, even that crude pancreatic extracts changed the lives of these dying children tremendously. You can see this uh, kid after giving insulin how he has recovered. So these are the landmark uh, you know uh, events in the history of insulin, all of which have led to the the, the winning of Nobel prizes. The initially the isolation of insulin from the pancreas by Bantin, uh, and then also the macleod, the Sanger uh, found the amino acid sequence of insulin, Hodgkin found three-dimensional structure of insulin, and subsequently Gilbert uh, was able to synthesize uh, you know, uh, insulin uh, by the recombinant DNA technology. So insulin is a pancreatic peptide hormone it's a main regulator of fuel biochemistry and animals totally deprived of it die within a few days. And insulin has both uh, anabolic actions as well as you know, uh, preventing the catabolism. So it prevents gluconeogenesis, uh, prevents glycogenolysis, breakdown of glycogen, prevents breakdown of fat lipolysis, prevents formation of ketone bodies by fat breakdown, prevents protein breakdown, proteolysis. It increases uptake of uh, glucose to the muscle 
and adipose tissue by which it reduces and controls the blood glucose and it uh, increases glycolysis utilization of glucose in the cells it uh, increases glycogen synthesis that is the deposition of glucose as glycogen in muscle and liver increases protein synthesis and increases uptake of uh, ions like potassium and phosphate this is the evolution of the different types of insulin initially the active pancreatic extracts uh, the type of insulin uh, mainly from beef and pork then the insulin was further purified by various technology like acid ethanol extraction and recrystallization chromatography then the insulin's action was extended by addition of various things like zinc uh, and so on and the nph uh, uh, was a similar insulin st still used by uh, us in this country and then uh, human insulin was for, uh, discovered or the uh, the produce used in genetic engineering and then uh, further developments led to uh, insulin analogs there are different types of analogs rapid acting analogs then long acting analogs we call them basin analogs and now we have ultra short acting insulin analogs and then um, there are insulin non insulin combinations and even weekly insulin so there are a whole lot of uh, changes that has happened over this last 100 years so insulin is produced as a single molecule and uh, during the the processing a part of the insulin molecule pro insulin molecule breaks away we call that connecting peptide or the c peptide and uh, thus two chains are formed the a chain and the b chain uh, so this is the pro insulin molecule and the cleavage of the connecting peptide that leads to the two chains and this is the three dimensional structure of the insulin and uh, normally insulin exists in hexamers uh, there are six insulin molecules which is uh, linked with the zinc molecule zinc ion so what happens when there is no insulin if there are severe and acute deficiency of insulin people get really uh, very bad metabolic disequilibrium it leads to uh, very high levels of glucose and ultimately lead into things like um, diabetic coma and this is further precipitated by the breakdown of the lipids which leads to formation of ketone bodies and also the breakdown of protein which leads to liberation of uh, amino acid and further providing fuel for formation and synthesis of glucose the gluconeogenesis when it is more chronic it leads to chronic organ dysfunction and damage like retinopathy nephropathy and uh, neuropathy and also increases the risk of uh, atherosclerotic process and cardiovascular disease it is very important to understand the insulin physiology which is a cornerstone to understand insulin therapy now this is the normal sort of pattern in a normal individual you have some amount of basal insulin always and with each meal there is a surge of insulin the prandial insulin surge and what happens in type 2 diabetic patients are uh, you have some amount of basal insulin that is why you don't develop ketoacidosis but uh, the insulin peaks are less uh, or the, the you know they are not as high as in a normal person and in type 1 there is absolute insulin deficiency and this is the worst uh, situation now let me take you through uh, the action profiles of different insulin now this is the normal insulin secretion at meal time and what happens when you given the regular or short acting insulin the the insulin comes up but it is a little later than the usual the endogenous insulin curve and also this persists little later so that is why the postprandial control may be suboptimal with this sort of insulin and also sometimes you might get slightly low sugar before the next meal so the examples are the actrapid humulin r insulin which are available in our market now let's take a rapid acting analog this rapid acting analogs is more or less try to mimic the endogenous insulin secretion after a meal you can see it's a more rapid in onset and also more rapid in offset examples are insulin aspar these are all analogs lispro and glulisine and then um, let's look at the nph which is an intermediate type of insulin you don't get a, like a good uh, 
like a peak, like in the short acting and um, rapid acting analogs, and this is more protracted. This is not ideal for uh, uh, prandial glucose control because the peak is not there as in normal insulin secretion. And then the examples are insulatard and humulin N. And uh, now this is a premix insulin, uh, the action profile. In, pre in the premix, there's a combination of short acting and intermediate acting insulin in different proportions. Uh, and here the short acting insulin gives a peak and uh, uh, intermediate acting gives a protracted action profile. So this is generally better than the, the, the intermediate acting, but uh, not as good as the short acting uh, ones for prandial glucose control. The examples are humulin 7030, mixtard 3070, hum insuman and various combinations are there, even 50-50 combinations are there. And then there are analog mixers like the Normix 30 humalog mix, where uh, insulin aspart and insulin lispro have been uh, mixed with isophane insulin. Then you have the base um, basal, or we call them peakless insulin, where it, they are ideal for giving basal insulin replacement because there's no peak and there's a, like a <clears throat> uh, peakless profile. And the examples are Detamia insulin, glargin insulin, Degludec, and now there is an insulin called Isodec, which is a weekly insulin, all of which are basal insulin analogs. So when it comes to type 1 diabetes, it is life-saving as I have already alluded to. And then also you need multiple daily doses of insulin to mimic the endogenous insulin profile because you need the basal insulin cover as well as insulin to cover the postprandial increase in blood glucose uh, because the, there's absolute insulin deficiency. So this is a bit of a typical pattern of a, uh, what we call basal bolus regime. We call it basal bolus because we give the bolusers to cover the three meals and a basal insulin cover to uh, uh, give the basal insulin requirement, which is important to prevent fat breakdown when there is uh, during the fasting period. The examples are illustrated here. And then uh, now in type one, uh, particularly in the developed countries, they give uh, insulin via insulin pump. So you have various pump regimes where you can give boluses through the pump as well as you can have some uh, ongoing trickle of insulin as basal insulin replacement. And then you can have various types of boluses, various types of uh, you know, basal therapies, which can be programmed in the insulin pump, which I'm not going to detail. So in type one, you need insulin from the onset. Sometimes you can go into what's called a honeymoon period. After the in insulin is uh, introduced, some people get a period where you hardly need any insulin. We call this honeymoon period because the insulin reduces the glucotoxicity and also reduces the inflammation in the pancreas. You might come out of insulin for a variable period, but soon will need insulin for the rest of the life. The evidence for the use of insulin, um, particularly the for tight glycemic control was given by this study called the Diabetes Complications and Control or DCCT study done in America. And you can see it showed that compared to the conventional um, intensive insulin therapy showed that the retinopathy, laser treatment, microalbuminuria, albuminuria, neuropathy, all can be reduced by intensive glycemic control. And what about insulin in type two diabetes? So how to initiate insulin in type two diabetes? I would like to excuse for a minute to switch on the AC. Uh, so there are uh, situations where a type two diabetic patient can be diagnosed with very high blood glucose with the HbA1c like uh, more than 9%. So in that scenario, sometimes you might need insulin for initial good control. You can use basal insulin with oral hypoglycemic agents. And sometimes actually, if the blood glucose is very high, you might need you know, more than one uh, dose of insulin. And subsequently, you can intensify. We will discuss as we go on. Particularly most of the type two diabetes we give insulin have initiation of insulin after oral hypoglycemic failure. So the general recommendation is to initiate 
basal insulin uh, and particularly in our setting where uh, the basal analogs are not available for everybody we might even start with uh, like isofen insulin usually with uh, other therapies uh, particularly metformin we don't omit and usually and other non insulin therapies also might be most often continued you can start with a smaller dose and uh, adjust um, you know weekly uh, or even you know uh, at a uh, uh, two weekly or so based on the response of the blood glucose so this is a sort of a typical pattern of a once daily uh, basal or uh, intermediate acting insulin replacement this is particularly good for type 2 diabetes when the blood glucose control is not optimal with oral therapy this is not suitable for type 1 as i have described and sometimes with time the basal insulin alone is not able to control your glycosylated hemoglobin or hba1c and then in this scenario the current guidelines recommend three options one is to think of adding a uh, rapid acting insulin uh, or short acting insulin to cover the biggest meal usually now people it is the lunch uh, the, we call this basal plus regime and then if the blood glucose is high throughout the day another option is to change over to premix insulin twice a day before breakfast and before supper and this is one of the another common uh, treatments that we give and in particularly developed countries they also recommend to add a non insulin type of a injectable called glp1 receptor agonist because that has also got lot of other benefits so these are the three options but the two uh, insulin options are given on the two sides and then uh, these are the sort of uh, uh, profiles that you might get with twice daily insulin so this is like a twice daily isofen or the intermediate acting insulin profile you can see you don't get the peaks you get some amount of replacement but this is not good for control of postprandial blood glucose and this is like a, uh, the premix insulin replacement you have a short acting insulin which will be able to control the blood glucose uh, after the meal and then the intermediate acting insulin that gives a, a fair amount of background insulin to control the overall glucose control and the last one in the bottom shows like a premix insulin using uh, short acting analog mixers where it is the the peak for the short acting is earlier than the uh, the other the insulin profile and then Uh, now let's see what uh, if we went on these options particularly if we went on the basal plus regime uh, if the blood glucose is not controlled then you need to give boluses for all three meals we call that basal bolus regime and then uh, if we went on the twice daily premix insulin if the blood glucose is not controlled then uh, we have options of giving three premix insulins particularly this one we need to give short acting combinations like analog mixers and particularly uh, the 50 50 mix is the best for this sort of combination and sometimes another uh, possible method is to give two doses of premix uh, long acting premix uh, insulins like 30 70 with the short acting insulin midway and depending on the blood glucose profile you can change from one option to the other now if everything is not working for the good glycemic control particularly in situations where you need very tight glycemic control like in pregnancy you might need to give three doses of uh, boluses uh, and also background uh, basal insulin treatment like in basal bolus regime and this is sort of a pump profile where you can give the boluses through the pump as well as a continuous trickle of short acting insulin to provide background insulin or the basal replacement what are the uh, basal insulins available nph detamia glargin degludec isodec uh, i have told all about these things and with their profiles and uh, there are uh, the if you take the glucose control the the profiles the glucose control both hba1c and the fasting blood glucose control is more or less same in the nph and glargin comparison so the difference in the these types of long acting analogs so basal analogs compared to the intermediate acting nph is that they have less risk of 
hypoglycemia. So that is the major advantage of this long-acting uh, insulin analogs. And here is a comparison between the glargine and the detamia. You can see uh, particularly the glargine has a longer acting uh, you know, profile. So the glargine has better glucose control uh, when compared to detamia. Uh, and the longer the action of the basal analog like if the same thing is uh, you know, seen in the comparison of this insulin called Degludec, uh, because you can see the comparison of the half-life of insulin Degludec in this curve compared to glargine, it is you know, as about twice that of glargine. So in this uh, comparison between glargine and Degludec, you show less hypoglycemia and um, less severe hypoglycemia, less nocturnal hypoglycemia, and the blood glucose control, particularly in terms of HbA1c, is not that significant. Uh, fasting plasma glucose is slightly better in the degludec because the lesser the hypoglycemia, you can take higher dose of insulin to control blood glucose. So when patients need very high doses of insulin, what, what are the options? Particularly some patients need at one shot, particularly obese people, those who are insulin resistant, even more than 100 units of insulin per dose. So then you might not be able to give uh, in one injection because even if you take the insulin injection, it is it can give mostly 100 units per ml. And even the pens cannot give more than usual traditional pens can't give more than 100 units. So the, uh, uh, the, the answer to this problem has been uh, overcome or the, uh, by formation of concentrated insulins particularly this humulin R uh, U500 has per ml 500 units compared to the traditional insulin, which has 100 units per ml. So you can give very high doses of insulin using concentrated insulins. Then the novel insulins, you can, if you compare with traditional insulins, you have better safety because less hypoglycemia and uh, slightly better uh, HbA1c in some of the studies and also slightly better in terms of weight gain because of the lesser hypoglycemia, people uh, does not lead to take too much calories to prevent hypoglycemia. And then it can be considered more physiological and also uh, they can lead to improvement of the quality of life because particularly the short acting insulins can be, uh, analogs can be taken just before the meals or if you have forgotten even just after, which increases the convenience. And uh, in this comparison of the basal analogs versus the NPH, they have shown like, you know, a particularly hypoglycemia risk of the analogs is less than the NPH. But the HbA1c, if you see here, they, there is hardly any change in the HbA1c in the two types of uh, insulins. Now let's talk about some practical aspects of insulin treatment about storage. You should not freeze the insulin because if you freeze the insulin into less than uh, zero degrees Celsius, insulin gets destroyed. Similarly, if the, uh, the temperature goes more than 40 degrees, it slowly loses the activity. So insulin storage is very important, particularly in the lower compartment of the refrigerator, you need to um, insulin. And also you need to check whether the insulin is expired you should throw away expired insulin because it can cause a lot of other issues if you use insulin and expired insulin. And also very important to keep the insulin, uh, the, the, the date that it was opened and labeled it like that. And also you should avoid shaking the insulins excessively. That is also not good. And particularly uh, you need to have good techniques for insulin administration, particularly uh, the, how to take the insulin Giving, putting some air into the vial so that the insulin ad, uh, the aspiration is easy. And then uh, particularly if you want, uh, before giving insulin, very gently rolling the insulin pen or the vial between your hands to you know, dissolve the insulin crystals. And then the techniques of administration, uh, uh, making the insulin uh, pen or the uh, pen particularly um, zero initially and then uh, dial into the appropriate number of units and then making a skin fold like this and particularly uh, you need to give with the current smaller insulin uh, needles 
uh, at 90 degrees to the skin uh, the, the skin and also then uh, injecting particularly you, if you are using a pen you inject and hold on for a few seconds until the insulin is fully given so these sort of techniques are very important and here is how you should uh, make the skin fold and injecting at 90 degrees and uh, coming to various devices that are used for insulin therapy these are the type of insulin syringes that we used to use when we were you know medical students about 20 years ago and then came the insulin syringes traditional syringes still available in the hospitals and also a lot of patients use syringes and then there are pens and there are even smarter pens and then you have insulin uh, sort of pumps and you can see there are very handy pumps which are very small uh, can be even uh, you know worn without others noticing particularly other things like insulin uh, when you are using insulin disposal of the waste syringes and the needles and the lancets all are very important to be safely undertaken particularly some patients like you know sportsmen the young people children uh, pregnancy these are the special situations where you might need to be very careful because the sugar fluctuations are very high in these groups of people and particularly during sicknesses. So uh, particularly we need to educate people how to change their insulin, particularly during these periods and a lot of education of the patient as well as their carers, parents, uh, teachers are important in managing these sort of patients. Now, uh, the various algorithms are there in titrating insulin uh, when you have started insulin but you should uh, use always very simple algorithms which will uh, which has been shown over and over in many studies uh, to be very flexible and also prevent patients going into hypoglycemia like you know uh, using um, uh, every third day uh, increase in two units if, and if the uh, fasting plasma glucose target is uh, you know, not achieved uh, if the levels are high and so on. Uh, so these sort of simple methods needs to be used uh, in patient education. And then also, uh, do you, when you are titrating the insulin, the studies have sh uh, looked into whether the better outcome is if the physician is primarily responsible for titration or whether the patient-led titration is more successful. And studies have shown in particularly educated patients, if you have given them good education, even patient-led titration can be more effective compared to uh, the physician-led uh, titration. This is a bit of a picture of an insulin pump. You see there's a pump, then there's a like a part where the insulin reservoir can be uh, you know, stored. And then uh, the, there's a tubing which is connected to the insulin secreting infusion set and the cannula. And there are various benefits and the limitations of pumps. Benefits are that you don't need to give multiple uh, pricks uh, during a day. And also you can make various adjustments to various algorithms to reduce the variability and to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia and overall improve the quality of life. The limitations are that mainly the costs are prohibitive, particularly in countries like us. And sometimes if without our knowledge, if the pumping action stops, we have the risk of getting into diabetic ketoacidosis. And um, also there can be initial worsening of things like retinopathy because of the very tight control that you achieve the initially, but overall long run, the improvement is much better. The insulin pump has evolved from very crude designs like this to very handy designs like this. And then uh, particularly in insulin uh, treatment, blood glucose monitoring is very, very important. Uh, the self monitoring of blood glucose is what we recommend using a glucometer. Earlier people used to check urine, uh, Benedictus, the strips, but now these are obsolete. And the overall th three months uh, average glucose test is, uh, levels are, tested using what we call glycosylated hemoglobin or HbA1c and uh, usually using the self-monitoring of blood glucose having some blood glucose logs is very useful particularly to uh, titrate the insulin nowadays uh, various you know new machines can 
themselves do these things with the mobile app. So these are the importance of uh, knowing some technology. And also you can uh, have uh, insulin dose recorded and the blood glucose as well as your meals recorded. And then again, there are apps for, uh, to do uh, these things for us. And now ladies and gentlemen, let's look at what's new in insulin therapy. Now insulin, I, as I told you, has come over a hundred year journey. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, various new insulins where they are ultra rapid insulins like the FIASP and then uh, once weekly insulin. And then I told you about the pumps and then now you have the, uh, the closed loop systems mimicking an artificial pancreas. And then uh, we need to always think about preventing hypoglycemia and improving quality of life when we are giving insulin. So in summary, insulin is life-saving in type one and the, there's good evidence for intensive control. There are different types of insulins. Then the multiple injections and uh, insulin pump therapy using the continuous infusion is best for type one. Glucose monitoring is very, very important when you are giving insulin and also particularly in type one, things like carb counting and multidisciplinary involvement, particularly uh, individualizing the glycemic target and glucose monitoring, considering the socioeconomic aspects in uh, deciding the technology and educating the patients on the prevention and management of hypoglycemia and also promoting continued ad adherence to healthy diet and physical activity is very important. And we need to be enthusiastic and confident to encourage and empower our patients. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Prasad. Uh, our time is up, but uh, there are uh, one or two questions. You could uh, answer them in the chat as well, but uh, we will just take the, uh, the first uh, the one question, how to adjust insulin and oral hypoglycemic drugs in acute illnesses. If you can very uh, briefly uh, explain and then probably answer the other one. But in the maximum dose or higher doses with long-acting insulin in the chat, Prasad. So the in the acute stages, we need to see whether there are any drugs that is not uh, suitable to be continued. Particularly if somebody is um, acutely ill and risk has risk of lactic acidosis, some and uh, acute renal failure, you might have to reduce or stop uh, metformin and particularly newer. Uh, oral hypoglycemic agents like SGLT2. And anyway, sometimes because of the erratic absorption and erratic uh, action, long acting uh, you know, tablets, even like sulfonylureas might have to be stopped. And uh, then insulin might be used for overall control. And with uh, more uh, very closer monitoring, you need to adjust insulin. And sometimes even you might have to use insulin infusion uh, uh, using pumps. Uh, to get the best control. Uh, so can we go for higher doses when we are long acting insulin? Uh, um, yes, we can go into high doses. Even you can give about 200, 300 uh, uh, dose, uh, you know, per dose. And um, in patients who do not have refrigerated, uh, but particularly like, you know, um, uh, this new insulin, if they are using pens, uh, they can be kept uh, in a colder and, uh, environment like a dryer where there is uh, less exposure to the light. So that is something that you can do. And in uh, some areas, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, what uh, people do is they use, particularly in the very hot areas, uh, they use a, this a pot where you put uh, water and uh, hang the insulin while uh, not touching the water and those sort of things. Uh, so those are very crude methods uh, if they don't have the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, proper refrigeration uh, techniques. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prasad. In the interest of time, we will uh, uh, move on to the uh, next lecture, uh, which is uh, on hyperglycemia emergencies by Dr. Uh, Milanka Vattegama. She's a consultant endocrinologist and senior lecturer in Department of Physiology, University of Moratua.
So over to you, Milanka, uh, to talk about hyperglycemic emergencies. Thank you very much sir, for that kind introduction. Um, I hope my slides are visible. Yes, if yeah. you can uh, yes. put them in the mode. Uh, yeah, now it's fine. Okay, uh, so I'll be talking about the hyperglycemic emergencies and my main focus would be on principles of management. So uh, let's start off uh, since most of you all are junior doctors who are attending the conference, the forum today. Let's start off by just um, taking a clinical scenario which you will encounter as house officers and um, medical officers later on. So uh, it's a 20 year old male who is presenting with the, who has been feeling lethargic for the last few days and says he's finding it difficult to breathe. And uh, he doesn't have any other significant history in his uh, past medical history. However, he says that he has been having polyuria and increased uh, thirst for the last few weeks. And on examination, he's very ill looking, thin build and running of temperature, severely dehydrated. And at the same time, he has a very high respiratory rate. Also, you get a like a fruity smell in his breath. He's tachycardic and having a low blood pressure. So with this uh, as, as our background, let's see what these hyperglycemic emergencies that we encounter. So there are two main emergencies that, are, that we come into contact with when dealing with hyperglycemic patients. One is uh, the diabetic ketoacidosis. This is actually regarded as the hallmark of type 1 diabetes because in a patient, if he gives a, if the patient doesn't have a history of BKA, we always question whether this is a type 1 or not. Um, on the other hand, what we see mostly in type 2 is what's called the hyposmolar hyperglycemic state, which is uh, known as HHS. So these are the two main emergencies that are um, encountered in diabetic patients. So the cardinal features of the two would be if you take diabetic ketoacidosis, as the name implies, there's hyperglycemia, there's ketoacidosis, and of course, there's dehydration in addition to that. But what happens in HHS is slightly different. I will come into the pathophysiology later on. Here you see hyperglycemia. Of course, dehydration is there, but you do not see the ketoacidosis as in DKA. Rather, you see a high osmolality, as the name implies. However much there are slight differences in the pathophysiology and maybe in the management slightly, there is considerable overlap. And when it's... Sometimes people say young patients present with TK, older patients would present with HHS. Still, sometimes it's difficult to uh, clearly delineate which is which. So going back to the patient, the patient is uh, in the ward or in your casualty ward or the emergency unit, and you've been told to assess and you ask to just check a random blood sugar, which, is, which comes quite high. And maybe you can get the urine ketones. Of course, in developed countries, it has a ketone meter as well, which you can use. And if you have the facilities, you can get an urgent arterial blood gas, which shows acidosis. And of course, since he's running a fever, you may do a full blood count <clears throat> and it would show leukocytosis. Um, so the um, major, like the laboratory findings in DK and HHS, as I told you earlier. <coughs> excuse me. So in DK, you get an anion gap acidosis, whereas in HHS, you do not. And osmolality wise, you get a very high osmolality with HHS, but not in DKA. Hyperglycemia, the level of hyperglycemia also differ between the two, whereas in HHS, it's very high sugar. DKA, it's not that high. And of course, the ketone urea or the blood ketones are not positive in DKA, uh, sorry, in HHS, and which is present in DKA. So uh, let's take one by one and see how it goes. So in diabetic ketoacidosis, the main cardinal features are hyperglycemia, acidosis, and severe volume depletion. 
So um, I think uh, Prof explained this nicely in his previous lecture, uh, which made it much easier for me. So insulin is an anabolic hormone. It acts on the peripheral tissues, mainly the muscle, the liver, and the adipose tissue. So what it does is it produces, since it's an anabolic hormone, it helps in glycogenesis and protein synthesis and adipogenesis and reduces adipolysis. So we know diabetes is a state, either you are having um, absolute insulin deficiency or relative insulin deficiency. So when it comes to diabetic ketoacidosis, and I said that it's the hallmark in type 1 diabetes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, what you get is absent insulin. So when there's absent insulin, that leads to hyperglycemia, mainly because all your catabolic hormones or the counter-regulatory hormones are increased in our system, like glucagon, the cortisol, and the epinephrines, and later on, maybe the growth hormone. And this, in turn, increases the glycogenolysis, and also uh, this gives rise to um, li lipolysis uh, in the adipose tissue and uh, proteolysis in the muscle. So that's why our patient was cachectic, or mostly these type 1 diabetic patients are quite thin. They are in a catabolic state. So when there is no insulin in your system, it's like, I hope you remember from your biochemistry days, there is the fed state and the starving state. So this is like a starvation where you do not have um, enough, uh, the, the peripheral cells cannot take up glucose into, their, into the intracellular environment because the absence of insulin. So here what happens is um, because of the starvation state, uh, uh, the system switches on the free fatty acid oxidation. So there's more and more free fatty acid being produced. And again, going back to your biochemistry, the more free fatty acid, what happens in metabolism is ultimately produces ketone bodies. So this is what we detect in the blood or urine in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. So again, it's a vicious cycle. What happens is what since, uh, again, there's glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis happening due to the counter-regulatory hormones. This in turn, again, aggravates your hyperglycemia. So hyperglycemia, when there's glucose in our blood, it uh, causes a high osmolality. Therefore, there's more water being dragged into the extracellular volume. Ultimately, this is um, uh, excreted via the urine, so you get a glycosuria. So whenever water is absorbed into these uh, extracellular, extracellular fluid, along with the water, you get the sodium. So you get more sodium running out of your system. So you get electrolyte imbalances. So ultimately, they end up being dehydrated and hypovolemia as the patient that we saw uh, in our presentation. So um, moving on. So... That's how you explain the clinical features of uh, this um, DKA, where, like I said, there's hyperglycemia, and hyperglycemia causes polyuria, and there's ketonuria because of the excess free fatty acid oxidation, and then in turn, because of the uh, polyuria and increased um, water being absorbed into the extracellular volume, the effective blood volume is reduced. Your blood pressures crash, you get a tachycardia as a reactive tachycardia. And because there's high ketone bodies in the system, you get a different type of a breathing pattern and also the fruity smell in your breath. And in severe cases, since there is relative dehydration in our system, this could be lead to uh, cerebral uh, dysfunction where you can get altered mental status, which is seen in severe DKA. And of course, the patient is severely dehydrated uh, as well. So it's a spectrum, like uh, I told you before. So in it depends whether you are absolutely insulin deficient or it's a relative deficiency. So in absolute insulin deficiency, I said 
because there's no insulin, the system switches on the free fatty acid oxidation. Therefore, there's more keto, ketone bodies produced. However, in um, hyposmolar hyperglycemic state, what happens is there's relative insulin deficiency. So whatever the insulin which is present, it can counteract the free fatty acid oxidation or lipolysis. Therefore, there won't be any lipolysis happening at that end of the spectrum. Therefore, you will not get ketone bodies produced in HHS. Rather, you get a hyper or smaller state with your hyperglycemia. And it has inherent uh, complications because of the hyposmolality, there's severe hemoconcentration, and there's a risk of thrombosis in these patients giving rise to deep, deep vein thrombosis. So always remember that there, this is, of course, a uh, spectrum where uh, BKA is mostly due to the absolute deficiency, but HHS is mostly due to relative deficiency of insulin. So uh, what actually triggers these emergencies is another important factor that we should remember because that is most of the time the causative factor which we need to treat. Mostly it's in infection, but at the same time, if a patient who's on insulin for type 1 diabetes has forgotten or has not been compliant with his insulin can present with a DK episode or recurrent episodes even. So, and the other, other uh, causative factor is stress. Um, so, so coming back to the main focus of that lecture, the principles of um, therapy. Um, so like I said, these patients lose a lot of water from their system. They're severely dehydrated, just as we saw in our patients. So we need to replace the fluid loss. They don't have insulin. That's the main problem they have. So we need to give insulin. And I said, with the, uh, along with the water, they lose a lot of electrolytes and there's some uh, but, uh, like uh, changes in the potassium as well due to the insulin therapy. So you need to correct the electrolyte abnormalities and most importantly, identify and correct the underlying precipitant factor and manage the complications that you would uh, encounter during these emergencies. So let's take one by one. So what we do for fluid loss to uh, recorrect the fluid loss is we start them on IV fluid replacement. So what does it actually do? It corrects dehydration and restores end organ perfusion. Also, there is a, a role played by this IV fluid in halting the progressive acidosis, which is going inside our system. So again, how does insulin help in DKA and HHS? It stimulates glucose uptake from the peripheral tissue. That is the main um, drawback. When you don't have insulin, you can, there's no um, way of getting the glucose into the intracellular uh, intracellular environment of the peripheral tissues, mainly muscle and the liver, so uh, and the adipose tissue. So by giving insulin, we try to come, that's how we uh, slowly get the hyperglycemia back to normal glycemic levels. And importantly, insulin is important to inhibit lipolysis and the ketone body production. And this in turn reverses the acidosis because if there's insulin, there won't be lipolysis, then the ketone body production will be reduced and in turn, the acidosis will be reversed. So what uh, you need to have a look at your potassium levels in these patients, because when you give insulin, we know insulin stimulates the transport, transcellular transport of potassium. So all, every time when you start them in insulin as treatment, uh, we need to have a close look at the potassium because if it is, on the lower side, we need to replace it. Then the, uh, we need to manage complications. So if you give insulin, here we need to give insulin as intravenous infusions, uh, which is uh, which ha always has the other end of the balance, right? Can tip off the balance to hypoglycemia if we use a higher dose, or for some reason, if the tubing gets uh, problematic, or if for some reason, uh, it's always, you have to be cautious when you use an insulin infusion, you have to do it under strict um, monitoring. So always uh, we 
once it's come has come to a target, we encourage in the protocols to change into a five or ten percent or five percent dextrose infusion along with the insulin infusion to avoid hypoglycemia. And especially in children, they could uh, encounter cerebral edema. This is not commonly seen among adults. So this is mainly secondary to the rapid decline in plasma osmolality with treatment. So that and in which in turn results in efflux of water into the brain. And as I told you in HHS, there's always um, the problem of having a DVT. So sometimes you may need to prophylactically start them on um, anticoagulants uh, while being managed for HHS. So there are uh, standardized protocols by uh, uh, world organizations like the ADA or the NICE guidelines in the UK. So basically, this uh, is a bit of a crowded um, slide, but however, it just touches upon what I've been telling and it's the protocol that's usually followed. So you have to start with the IV fluids and if it's uh, in severe hypovolemia, the rate of IV fluid uh, administration is different. If it's in cardiogenic shock, of course, the monitoring and the management would differ. But in a mild dehydration, you had to correct uh, the dehydration, and then you had to start on the insulin. So we usually start on a 0.1 unit per kilogram body weight IV uh, infusion. Some advocate giving a bolus and changing on the infusion, whereas some guidelines will just say to start the infusion straight away. And the main difference here is like in DKA uh, and HHS, like I said, uh, we slightly change the doses uh, at a certain target, which you will learn as you go on. And then uh, of course, uh, replacing your potassium when you start your insulin infusion is also an important uh, point to remember. So, Going back to the patient, so he was quite ill and we realized he's in DKA and we, it's an emergency. So always, always your ABC comes come first. So you have to check your airway. Mostly in these patients, unless they're in severe DKA, you will not um, encounter any problem with the airway. However, you have to make sure there's adequate ventilation and oxygenation. Check the circulation attached to the monitor to large pore. Uh, we can only start the clinical assessment, catheterize, you need to monitor the urine output. If the systolic blood pressure is less than 90, but start off with the IV bolus, and then once it is, uh, we may repeat it if it's necessary. Once it's more than 90, you have uh, the continue the fluid replacement. There are certain protocols that you can follow. And as I told you, don't forget your potassium, which you need to be replaced. Uh, and uh, the commence the fixed rate intravenous insulin infusion. And most importantly, now this patient particularly came with a fever. So most likely the precipitant would be an infection. So always you need to do an infection screen hand in hand with the DKA management. And of course, start your preemptive antibiotics. Assess the response. You have to see whether the patient is responding to this initial insulin dose. We expect a 10% drop of uh, glucose, if not, we need to double the dose. So uh, we have to always assess the response and also continue the uh, monitoring of your vitals. And uh, once the DK is resolved, when the acidosis is no longer there and the patient can eat and drink, we may switch on to the subcutaneous regimes that Prof spoke about early on. Um, but this has to be done carefully because you have to always remember the moment you stop the insulin infusion, the uh, hyperglycemia can rebound. So you have to always um, overlap as in once as the insulin infusion is continuing, you need to give your first subcut dose and maybe wait for 30 to 30 minutes to one hour before stopping the insulin infusion. So if we do that, you may save a life. So that's the main take home message I would like to emphasize is these are emergencies. So you need to act 
and you, know, you need to act fast to save a life. But always remember, you cannot act fast if you don't know what's going in going uh, in, in this patient. So you have to always remember to understand the pathophysiology because it is paramount to guide the therapy. So that brings me to the end of the lecture. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Milanka, for that elaborate uh, description of the hyper glycemic emergency. So there are a couple of questions. Uh, there is one uh, from how does acidosis arise in DKA? I suppose you explained, but you can uh, answer that again. Yes. So like I said, what happens is in DKA, you don't have your insulin. Insulin is needed to, for what insulin is an anabolic hormone. So what it does is it's a, it causes lipogenesis. But the moment the insulin is not there in the system, it, it promotes lipolysis. So when there's lipolysis, there's more free fatty acid being produced. And the more the free fatty acids are in the system, ultimately you, from your biochemistry, you know that if the metabolism of free fatty acid ends up with ketone bodies. So that's the ketone bodies are acidotic. That's what makes acidemia in diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, thank you. Uh, then there's another question. Does hyperosmolar non-ketotic state has any sort of resistance to insulin? Uh, well, not really. Uh, we don't see there's resistance, but you need to be careful with the doses here because you cannot use a very high dose in this patient. We have to remember that this is a relative insulin deficient state in these patients, mainly type 2. They have insulin in their system, so you cannot use a very high dose, and they're quite elderly, so you don't want them to go into hypoglycemia. So what you need to do is you have to come down on the dose, but there's no resistance as such. But generally, there'll be insulin resistance Consistent people who get this, yes. but this particular it's state fine. itself might not uh, this thing. So, in the let me check. Uh, yeah, in the absence of uh, any more questions, uh, thank you very much, Milanka, for that very uh, elaborate lecture. So, let's uh, get on with the next lecture, which I'll be doing. Thank you very much, uh, Nilan, Milanka. So the next lecture is uh, is more of uh, one for the road. What I'm going to do is on diabetes and COVID. And I'm sure this is a evolved, highly evolving uh, new topic, which may for sure uh, come in your textbooks in future. And of course, in your virology, immunology, path pathology, in different modules or areas that you will encounter this uh, new knowledge that we have, we are learning at the moment. So let me start share the slides with you. Okay, I hope the uh, slides are visible and uh, uh, to everybody. Uh, that COVID and diabetes, and I've just put it as the new curriculum just to, you know, make it interesting. And Diabetes was the modern pandemic. As you know, the world has seen many pandemics. And uh, uh, in 1920, we had an influenza pandemic, which kills millions of uh, people. Then we had the pandemics of malaria and the other infectious diseases we have, which the world has managed to control effectively over the years. And in the recent uh, few past few decades, it has been the non-communicable diseases that has reached the pandemic proportions and diabetes is on top of that. As of now, there are about 463 million diabetes world over and uh, we can uh, start off in Sri Lanka. We don't have exact number, but we assume that it's about 15% of the adult population, but in the cities, we see that it's, it may go up to about 25%. Again, the number Southeast Asia is called the hotbed of uh, diabetes. And look at the projections for the next 20 years or so, 84% increase uh, is expected. If you go on, if you don't intervene and do something in our part of the world, it's a massive increase that we'll have to manage. Then out of the blues came the COVID-19 pandemic. 
which has infected over 250 million uh, uh, people all over the world and unfortunately caused the death of over 5 million people. Interestingly, each year, diabetes kills about, uh, about 4 million people. And it, uh, the last year, it had been about 4.2 million deaths uh, due to uh, diabetes. So what we actually see now is a clashing of two pandemics. One is a non-communicable disease, which, is, uh, which we call as a silent killer. The death comes very slowly in many different ways. And of course, the COVID-19, which is a very sort of a sudden respiratory symptoms plus other systemic symptoms and the death comes very fast. It has all happened because of this virus, which has uh, S1 and S2 spike proteins, nucleocapsid, then the uh, membranes, envelope, and the single stranded RNA enclosed within it. So it's a pretty much basic your virology, uh, similar to other viruses, but they are a little bigger and the, the spike proteins may uh, differ in them. And this virus, as shown before, its main uh, transmission is by droplets, by sneezing or coughing. The virus may spread up to about two meters uh, distance, but with speaking and other activities, normal breathing, it might not go that far and then it doesn't uh, stay in the air for a very long time and it just tends to uh, settle down uh, on, on surfaces. How it enters the cells is shown here. It's mainly through the uh, attachment of uh, the ACE2 uh, receptor here in our uh, body. So our ACE2 receptors are present in the respiratory tract, uh, the gastrointestinal GI, epithelium, liver, pancreas, heart, most of our uh, organs have the ACE2 receptor, then which is facilitated by this temperance uh, uh, molecule here, and we'll see more of that later. So when somebody inhales the, the SARS-CoV-2 or the coronavirus that is causing the COVID-19, it goes into the respiratory uh, track and then the cells will engulf the uh, virus and then it enters the epithelium, the viral RNA comes out and it's translated into proteins and there is virus assembly. Usual thing and that happens uh, with the virus is happening and here it uh, shows how it facilitates the entry to the ACE receptor and of course then our antigen presenting cells will uh, ingest that and present that to our T helper cells, which becomes, uh, you know, cytotoxic T cells will try to kill the uh, virus as much as possible. And there is B cells, which will start forming the antibody and the memory B cells. So it's pretty much same uh, to any virus. And this is for this virus also, it's the same. But there are certain differences in this new uh, virus, which we call as the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2 virus, which belongs to the family coronaviridae. It's a envelope single-stranded RNA virus with a genome of about 25 to 32 kilobytes. Seven of this, uh, fam uh, you know, viruses in this family are known to cause uh, illnesses, but the most severe ones were the SARS-CoV-1, the initial infection, uh, the, the infection that we saw uh, a few uh, a decade back and the Middle Eastern respiratory uh, syndrome also, you know, a few years, uh, 10 to 12 years back. But this one is different. It's much more infective, 10 to 20 fold higher infectivity and has affinity to the ACE receptor compared to others in the family. So that is the problem with this virus. And that's why it has reached pandemic proportions and killed so many people. You all are familiar with the, uh, the presentation. You know, the vast majority of people, luckily those who are infected will be asymptomatic. But about 20% will have uh, symptoms. And out of that, 
about 15% or 14% will be mildly symptomatic, just a fever, absence of smell, or aches and pains, that sort of a thing. And about 5% will be more severe, requiring uh, insulin, uh, oxygen uh, therapy and other treatment. And of course, roughly about 2%. And in Sri Lanka, it's, uh, the death rate is about 2.4% uh, as of now will succumb to the, uh, the illness. Symptoms, again, everybody is familiar, the usual respiratory symptoms, but uh, you get other uh, symptoms as well, especially in diabetics. So this whole pathophysiology of this uh, disease involves not just infecting the respiratory system, but there is widespread vascular microthrombotic events happening, affecting different organs. And depending on the organ, you might get different presentations. And in diabetics, this presentation seems to be more, and they seem to get silent myocardial infarctions, or you know, they present they might present only with a myocardial infarction or even a stroke, which we will look at those details later. This is a slightly more complex and a busy slide, but if I may take you through this, so when the virus enters the alveoli so there are a lot of uh, cytokines release what we call as the cytokine storm interleukin 6 and uh, uh, tnf alpha if you remember among others are the main factors that have been identified uh, uh, so far which cause multitude of uh, actions all these cytokines will uh, go to the brain and activate the hypothalamus release prostaglandins and then causes fever then there is widespread inflammation, which increases the capillary permeability, the pressure drops, the blood volume comes down, and there is decreased perfusion, which in turn, with the microemboli or the increased uh, uh, thrombotic uh, uh, thrombus formation, will uh, cause problems with the blood supply to the kidneys, where the blood urea and creatinine and renal toxicity will set in. Then same thing happens to the liver, where the liver enzymes uh, and bilirubin and CRP will go up and there's hepatotoxicity. Then, of course, in the alveoli, when there is leakage, there is alveoli edema and gas exchange is impaired, hypoxemia, and which will cause increased heart rate, respiratory rate, the physiology of, you know, multi-organ failure, all these things, factors culminating into multi-organ failure and that's how most people uh, succumb to this uh, illness. If I may simplify the factors shown there, it's the same thing, the ACE receptors and the endothelial activation and the microthrombi, which I was explaining before, which causes the changes in the blood vessel. There is plasma leakage and decrease in blood volume, hypovolemia and tissue ischemia. On the other side, there is widespread inflammation, then there is the cytokine, cytokine storm and the inflammatory response in most of the organs and damage. And purely in the lungs, there will be pulmonary edema, hypoxia causing ARDS, and eventually all these factors leading into multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. So this is in a very sort of a basic manner, which I have, how I explain uh, the pathophysiology of the uh, COVID-19 viral illness. This would be uh, good to know uh, these days because now we see there is dengue, there is the common uh, cold, there is the normal flu, which we have seasonal flu. So how do you differentiate? So it's good to remember there will be a huge overlap between the signs and symptoms of these three, but generally the onset is little delayed with the coronavirus illness, but as you know, with the Delta variant, it may be even shorter, like four to five days, and the flu is one to four days, and the cold also similar period. Symptom onset is very gradual with coronavirus, but the flu, it's abrupt. And the symptoms generally, these two, the cold and the flu, last for a shorter period, and the coronavirus illness COVID-19 might go on for two weeks or even beyond. Fever is very common with COVID-19, but may not be there with the common cold. And the running nose is less common, but the Delta variant we have seen, people have uh, rhinorrhea as well. Sore throat, the typical sore throat is 
uh, more common with the cold than with COVID-19. And the cough is a signal, dry cough will be a, a, a characteristic feature with uh, COVID uh, infection. Body aches and pains, things like that is more common with the common cold. And of course, difficulty in breathing in apparently normal people also would be a characteristic sign that, uh, that you should suspect the COVID-19 infection. So when millions of people are infected, the, what we call as the antigenic shift and the drift uh, phenomenon, which you learn in virology and other, uh, you know, in medical school, gives the opportunity for the virus to uh, change and mutate and call different uh, variants than alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, which hit us very badly, which came from India, is the current most dominant. Now we are seeing even delta plus and minor variants of the delta, but which has not caused any change in the uh, the symptoms or the severity so far, thankfully. And what does this variance do? The, it's important to know the variance because of this RO number. This RO number is very important in epidemiology and how managing a pandemic because it gives an idea about uh, how many people uh, roughly a person infected with the virus. Basically, it's a measure of the infectivity of that particular variant. So you can see how things have evolved in Wuhan. When it started, it was low infectivity. And then with the alpha and the UK variants, it was four to five people. And delta, it's further worse. That's why it spread very quickly in India and in Sri Lanka five to eight people might get infected with one person. So you can see about three to four times higher infectivity and uh, with uh, the original virus and the, the Delta variant, what we have now. But of course, it's not as bad as mumps or measles, where you can see higher RO numbers. How do we, so the clinical uh, symptoms in this era is sometimes it's all what you need to uh, diagnose this people, especially with desaturation. If the oxygen saturation drops below 94% uh, with these respiratory symptoms, you don't need many more investigations. But we have developed uh, the PCR, the genome, this is reverse transcriptase PCR. Then we have the antigen test, the rapid antigen test. And then there are antibodies in people after about 10 to 12 days, they develop. So, with these tests, we could uh, diagnose uh, the uh, the condition. And the PCR, you had to know that you know it could be positive for a longer period of time. There's a CT value of less than 30 would be significant, and more than that is considered as non-significant. And the rapid antigen test, also, each test has its own sensitivity and positivity, which you will learn in your future. Uh, you know, uh, uh, rele in relevant lectures, I'm sure, will be done details when we have clearer uh, records or research done on these different tests. Generally, uh, the if you look at the stages of the disease, the viral response stage where you have the mild constitutional symptoms, lymphopenia, and then you got, get on to the pulmonary phase where you have the shortness of breath, hypoxia setting in, and then the chest imaging can be abnormal, liver enzymes can be high, and still the procalcitonin and other markers will be low. Then you get the hyperinflammatory stage where you get the ARDS, the inflammatory reaction, shock, cardiac failure, and the various inflammatory markers like interleukin-6, D-dimer, ferritin, LDH, CRP, and if you go into heart failure, the pro-BNP, all that will go up. Potential therapies, we are still, you know, in different stages of, uh, uh, you know, testing, but the steroids, dexamethasone has been by far at, from this stage onwards, which has shown a good defect. And then there are other promising drugs like remdesivir and tocilizumab and, and newer drugs are coming up and the latest to get phase three trial is Maluna per wheel. It's antiviral medication which acts early in the viral response 
uh, stage where we could develop as shown in this cartoon here, different stages of this viral pathway of, uh, you know, entry, tra replication, translation, replication, then the <coughs> formation of the mat mature virion and then release of the viruses. So at different levels, we'll have different drugs being tried, antiviral agents here, remdesivir here, then the, uh, the antibodies and the plasma can be tried here. So all these fact drugs are in different stages of uh, development. The future will tell you what comes up and uh, shows a promising result. So it's a highly fluid status where weekly we get new reports. At the moment, the best, uh, other than the, the social distancing and the health measure, the uh, uh, prophylactic measures that we have, that is the best. And then, of course, uh, the vaccines are our next best option to protect ourselves against the virus. So we have the Pfizer, Moderna. So these are all RNA vaccines. And I have given the characteristics here. They need minus 80 refrigeration, but can be kept for a few days in two to eight. So that is very uh, useful when it's given in the uh, you know, periphery and for us to give it. So up to about five days, we can keep it in a normal fridge. So then the viral vector vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine, Sputnik and the Johnson & Johnson, that is the only single dose vaccine so far that we have, that can be stored for a longer period in a normal refrigerator. Then the Chinese vaccine, Sinovac and the Sinopharm, which is widely used, it's a normal temperature. And the Novavax, the rate latest to come, is a protein-based uh, vaccine, which is called Novavax, which also can be stored. So we have an armamentarium of uh, you know, vaccines to protect us, the population, from the, the COVID infection. Now coming to the, the final, the other half of the topic, diabetes and COVID. How, why do people fare worse with diabetes? We have seen that from the beginning. This is the earliest uh, analysis of deaths done in Wuhan when the disease erupted. Uh, and then they showed that diabetes came second, come second to cardiovascular disease and 7.3% more death rates were, uh, uh, see, you can see 0.9 versus 7.3% death rate among diabetics with the COVID-19 infection. In Sri Lanka, our own data, which showed a staggering number of time. Most of the people who were above 60 have been diabetes. Almost 75% of deaths above 60 have been diabetes and other non-communicable diseases like hypertension, dyslipidemia, and heart problems. Out of the deaths, over all deaths, all age groups, 54.9% have been uh, diabetes. So you can see the scale of things, then other conditions also matter, but the rate, the percentage is less comparatively. Why is this? So here, this study shows, the observational study, that even people without diabetes, those who come into hospital not known, those who have hyperglycemia, above 7 millimoles, also has a poor outcome. 28-day mortality is about three times compared to people with low uh, sugar levels, blood glucose levels, and 28-day complications are also almost double in people with disease in induced or stress, hyperglycemia. They may not be even diabetes. Why is this? So I have shown that the ACE receptor is the key to, for the viral entry. And we know from other studies in diabetes, and especially type 2 diabetes, is closely associated with uh, obesity, we, where we call, we used to call the pandemic of diabetes uh, before uh, in type, for type 2 diabetes, and other co cardiovascular comorbidities, the ACE is upregulated. And all the pathophysiological changes that I've shown with the earlier slide, it's augmented basically in diabetes. So there's more inflammation, there's more uh, uh, damage to the lungs, heart, and the endothelium, and there's increased tendency 
to form thrombi or thrombotic, uh, uh, you know, coagulopathy is more in diabetes, and the complications will be more, which we look at earlier. But the general precautions would be the same for diabetes. Just being a diabetic, you will not catch the virus if you stick to the basics, hand washing, respiratory hygiene, social distancing, and avoiding unnecessary travel. And of course, if you are, take care to break this chain of spread, it doesn't matter. But if the virus enters by any chance, then only the problems will start. So for specific measures for a diabetic during this period of the endemic is to be have a good glycemic control, frequent monitoring to make sure that you do that, and then manage your other comorbidities like the heart problems, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and a balanced diet, proper nutrition, regular exercise, and self-quarantine irrespective of the regulations to prevent yourself and infecting uh, others, uh, minimize travel as much as possible if you are having poor glycemic control. It would be good to remember that we have seen lots of diabetics have died after recovering from COVID, like post-COVID state where they get secondary bacterial and other viral pneumonia. So getting yourself the elderly diabetics, especially getting uh, themselves uh, vaccinated for influenza and pneumococcal vaccinations would be of benefit, but under the managing physician's uh, uh, cover, you should not get it on your own. If you are non-infected or you know general conditions I have uh, mentioned before, how to get a good control and any of the medications, you don't have to stop. Although you say ACE receptor is there, you don't have to stop the ACE inhibitors. There is good evidence to say all the anti-diabetic medication, anti-hypertensive medications, aspirin, everything can be uh, continued. And if you happen to get the uh, infection, then let's uh, see the few uh, things about COVID and diabetes. Fever can be less common in diabetes. And the initial four or five days, they'll be sort of almost asymptomatic. And compared to the others, there's a rapid deterioration. So monitoring the oxygen saturation closely will be the key. And some may, you had this topic before, they may present with a hyperglycemic emergence with no respiratory symptoms, which we have seen. And I mentioned before, some may come with a myocardial infarction or a stroke. That is because this virus and the ACE2 receptor is omnipresent in all in most of the tissues. It has, can ent, virus can enter the myocardium direct. It can enter the endothelial uh, cells and cause all these problems, including myocarditis, arrhythmias, and then uh, thrombosis and coronary artery disease, leading to acute coronary syndromes, heart failure, and arrhythmias, which can result in sudden cardiac deaths in some of our diabetic patients. Same thing can happen uh, in the brain as well. So as you know, already baseline data increased cardiovascular risk due to all these factors mentioned here. And if they happen to be older also, and the male sex also is identified as a higher risk factor, and they have other uh, issues as well. The virus is supposed to decrease the insulin release from the beta cells as well. There are studies to show that the ACE receptor is there in beta cell as well as ACE2 receptor. So there is a vicious circle of, and there is increased insulin resistance, and there's a vicious circle of hyperglycemia also occurring in diabetics and of course in non-diabetics as well. And then this also with the steroids, which is essential for the management of the uh, hyperinflammatory state and the cytokine, cytokine storm also aggravates the, uh, the hyperglycemia, eventually all these culminating in severe disease and increased death in diabetics. So in patient, the diabetics will need more close monitoring. I would recommend hospital admissions for diabetics other than for 
mild COVID, moderate or severe, definitely they need, please don't advise your patients or known people to stay at home. Better to go into hospital, especially when there are beds available. Three to four times a day, glucose monitoring is essential and would be good to control the sugars and control the hypertension and other comorbidities and take the medication as uh, advised. This is a study which came out uh, uh, last year, which clearly shows that uh, if you are having uh, average sugar levels less than 10 millimoles, roughly translate into about 180 milligrams per deciliter, not a bad, very difficult target to manage. Your chances of survival would be 98.9. So that means about 1.1% will die if the sugar levels are low. But see the difference. If the sugars are about 200 or so, it, the death rate jumps to 11%. So it's 10 times higher than uh, uh, before. And of course, this is the scale of things, the con connection between diabetes and uh, COVID-19. Same is the same thing happens in the brain as well, which I mentioned before, increased risk of strokes and other thromboembolic uh, phenomenon. This is interesting for the young people, especially among the young, those who required uh, ICU admission and uh, those who had complications. When you analyze the young people, especially the below 40 age group that you can see below 60 age group that they were obese. It's the obese people who were having faring poorly with uh, uh, the COVID-19 infection without the other comorbidities. So obesity seems to be a risk factor in the young as well as the elderly. So we see that obesity is also, a, we call it a chronic condition. It's a chronic inflammatory condition where there is chronic inflammation in the fatty tissue and there's some degree of immune dysfunction and increased ACE2 receptor expression also in the lungs and other tissues. All this culminates in uh, impaired immunity and increased inflammatory response uh, causing severe disease and a poor clinical outcome in young obese people. So it's good to lose some weight and maintain your way, uh, weight this, during this period of uh, the COVID pandemic. Now, with the COVID initial wave settling a bit, we are increasingly seeing the post-COVID syndromes. Among the other things, uh, which you know, are pretty general aches and pains, joint pains, uh, mild depression, things like that, we are seeing post-COVID diabetes. In one study in India, they showed that about 14 to 15% of the, the people post-COVID, those who didn't have a diabetes, are, have shown to get new onset diabetes post-COVID. Many reasons for that. But this is the uh, situation. So maybe the inflammatory reaction or the release of insulin or destruction of the beta cells all could contribute to this new onset diabetes, probably in the people who were pre-diabetic or who had higher risk factors like obesity, and which I have explained this before about the beta cells and the COVID. It's interesting to note in India, luckily this did not hit us, the black fungus or the mucomycosis, uh, you know, uh, in India it showed that the new onset diabetes not the pre-existing diabetes, had a higher risk of getting this dreaded complication of black fungal disease or the mucomycosis as well. So we have to, be, we can't be complacent. We have to be on the lookout for these complications to come. So with COVID and diabetes, as you know, type 2 diabetes is a lifestyle disease. It's closely associated with your lifestyle. So under the new normal, how do we manage these two conditions effectively? As you know, we were through lots of lockdowns and being at home for a prolonged period of time, which had its own uh, the pros and cons, which we look at now. Your food patterns might have changed. You may have gone in for easily available, fast food, energy-rich uh, uh, 
a dense food, what is available, and people were confined to a place watching TV or on the computer and having snacks in between. And then, of course, some took it upon them to find the, uh, the exercise even at home with the extra time they have. Some had difficulties in getting their medication, and some might have gone into depression, mild depression due to change in the lifestyle, uh, economic problems, uh, loss of jobs, things like that, and availability of medical services were the challenges. We have to think differently and try to have a healthy diet as much as possible, maybe home gardening, think in a new way, innovatively, and you get your exercises and uh, the, uh, the mental balance at home, uh, engaging in uh, different things. As a family, you could start exercising. And of course, we had innovative ways of posting the medications online, uh, you know, consultations and methods to reduce your stress, whatever that suits you. And of course, uh, the online consultations and getting the medications were also the uh, things have come up greatly during this period that what we have seen as new. So advised by different authorities, the Europeans, they have advised uh, the, this cartoon was produced. So drink plenty of water, which I forgot to tell before, all diabetics, whether they are infected or not, you drink, hydrate yourself well, because we know certain diabetic drugs also, the new SGLT2 inhibitors also can be a little dehydrating. And then with the thrombotic events, and it could be detrimental if they get infected with the COVID virus. So use novel methods for socializing, avoiding a person to person contact and stress reduction. And these things I have discussed before with the previous slide. And also you making use of the technology to get your day-to-day -day needs, the medical needs, consultations, medicines uh, online as much as possible so that you can minimum, minimize travel. Of course, even now when the schools are open, universities are open, please note the three C's, which is mentioned by the uh, World Health Organization, crowded places. You, the universities may be open, but you have to avoid the crowded places, getting together in a close contact settings in the canteens and other maybe you know study groups and all that. You have to think twice before you engage in these activities. And of course, confine and enclosed spaces with poor ventilation or air conditioned places where a large amount of people are there. And of course, get togethers where all taking, removing their masks should be avoided. If you want to come out of this uh, pandemic, you know, we still haven't uh, sort of really come out. There is a good chance that there can be another wave if things continue as it is. Summarizing the COVID-19 and, uh, and diabetes, the impact, there's an overall impact on the patients, their pathophysiology, then the burden on the clinical labs doing all these tests, then the poor glycemic control worsening the disease, then providing the diabetes, mind you, the theme for Di World Diabetes Day, for which we have organized this uh, diabetes update with the SLMA was access to diabetes care. So there were severe impediments to access to diabetes care. And of course, the problems of, we have seen more DKA and HHS during this period. Then we have to look at the risk of metformin and other drugs when they are severely infected uh, patients where they could have uh, lactic acidosis and dehydration associated with SGLT2. So there are lots of new things that we have to think, protocols that we might have to create. And when new knowledge comes in, all these things will come into place. And I'm sure these things will come in your curriculum in future as a new chapter with COVID and of course a subsection, especially with COVID and uh, diabetes. So in summarizing uh, the topic, it's all preventive measures are the same. A mild diabetic patients can stay at home and they can join with the 247 or get the advice and manage at home if possible with monitoring of the uh, oxygen saturation. 
and of course mild to uh, moderate to severe patients all i would recommend hospital admission and you know stopping the sglt2 inhibitors if they are uh, you know the features of mild dehydration and stop the other drugs if there's renal impairment as uh, suitable so insulin therapy in especially in the severe and especially with steroids will be necessary in most of the hospital ad admitted patients the, then the newer drugs coming in remdesivir and the other antivirals interleukin 6 inhibitors all have different uh, side effects which can be you know additive in uh, diabetic patients patients with fatty liver and other comorbidities so you need to be updated on these factors and the new drugs that are being approved and used and look at their side effects and how it will affect the uh, diabetic patients and of course the comorbidities managing them would be of paramount importance to reduce the death rates among diabetics so if i may finish again summarizing please get the vaccines now diabetic above 60 will be getting a third dose is recommended so please recommend uh, getting the third dose for the elderly diabetics continue your ace inhibitors and arbs you don't have to stop because of the connection of the ace2 inhibitor which i forgot to mention before and you can continue all your regular anti-diabetic medication the mild moderate and severe i explained and of course the other measures that we have to do that's what we are doing now capacity building the health staff the knowledge building and the management and eventually everything will fall in place where we'll have protocols newer drugs better vaccines where we could manage this uh, covid and the diabetes and the covid 19 infection like the common cold in future to come hopefully all of us when you all are uh, doctors, uh, you will be managing this as a, just another viral illness. Thank you very much for listening and joining this diabetes update as well on a, a Saturday morning. Let me check whether you have put any. Okay, so some one person has asked uh, vaccine. I think I mentioned answered. Yes, booster doses are. Uh, recommended for the above 60 at the moment but it will as the evidence evolved we'll be thinking about the diabetes with uh, younger diabetics as well with comorbidities that will be giving booster doses but i think it's pretty much decided the pfizer vaccine uh, should be the vaccine uh, to be used as a, a booster dose uh, then so do COVID patients without cardiovascular disease should be on antiplatelets. At, yeah, so that is not recommended. We apply the same uh, criteria uh, to uh, 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 put people on aspirin. But of course, if the COVID-19 patients with diabetes or without diabetes, and if they are having high D-dimer levels, and we have the criteria where their oxygen saturation comes down, the moderate to severe disease, and the time of the cytokine comes down, yes, we give antiplatelets plus we give uh, enoxaparin as well in hospital. That is for the managing physicians to do, but I wouldn't say uh, somebody who is getting infected with COVID, mild disease, they should not start taking aspirin or statin. Sometimes it might be detrimental if you take it too early. So don't do that and it's not recommended it's the, the general uh, indication to start statins and aspirin in a diabetic and uh, can we get the presentation okay because there are a lot of complex things so i would say this should be the <clears throat> guideline for you to open your eyes and read up more because there is nothing concrete everything is evolving what i say today might not be the hundred uh, might not be 100% correct uh, in a month's time. So it's highly evolving, but I have touched upon the areas in virology, immunology, pathology, then the vaccines, all that, uh, and the clinical presentation, the available information now for you to read up and get an idea so that you can, on this platform, 
you could master the uh, or the future you could master the uh, the managing covid-19 plus uh, in especially in diabetes so i will try to uh, get a print out and uh, uh, through the slma through your channels uh, uh, share the slides uh, with you all uh, in appropriate manner in uh, by, by next week okay so on behalf of the sri lanka medical association and the sri lanka college of endocrinologists and the sri lanka diabetes federation i would like to thank all of you who have joined today and ask questions and hope you all had a uh, interesting session starting from the very basics to the the more current uh, covid and diabetes uh, have a great day thank you very much for joining